Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call this morning's uh, Senate Majority Policy Committee public hearing to order. My name is Dave Argel. I, I chair the committee. I want to thank everyone for their participation in today's public hearing. I especially want to thank Senator Scavello for bringing the committee to Northampton County today, as well as our host, the Wind Gap Middle School, for allowing us to use these uh, beautiful facilities. Uh, today's hearing is to learn more about Pennsylvania's clean fill and regulated fill standards. For more on the topic, I want to turn it over to our host, Senator Scavello, for uh, opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I was, uh, would also like to thank you for making the trip down to uh, my district for this important hearing. And good morning to all. I want to welcome everyone to our hearing this morning. I would like to extend a special thank you again to the chair for agreeing to host this hearing for, and to bring attention to important environmental issues affecting our Commonwealth. I also want to welcome staff from Senator Vascola's office. They're not here yet, but I'm assuming they will be here. State Representative Brown, Hahn, Emmerich, and Mako for attending this hearing. As you will see soon here, we have great cross-section of testifiers presenting today. Thank you to our panelists who have generously agreed to share their insights and concerns with the committee to help us better understand the Commonwealth's env environmental policies as they pertain to clean fill and regulated fill. Just as a point of clarification before we begin, several of you here today might be concerned about the issue of sudge and biosolids. Today's hearing is a separate issue and devoted to a discussion regarding commercial fill material. I want you to know that I've spoken with the Department of Environmental Pr Protection regarding the concerns over the proposed sludge treatment plant, and at my request, they have committed to a public hearing in the fall on the Sinego application before any permits are approved or issued. I want the public's concern addressed, and I will let you know when the hearing is firmed up and a date has been decided. Today's hearing is a culmination of several years of discussion and activity. My district includes the Slate Belt region of Northampton County, where we are today, which is one of the areas of the state where a high volume of clean fill material is deposited into abandoned slate quarries, other areas of Monroe, Carbon, Northampton, and Lehigh County receive both clean fill material and regulated fill. Much of this material comes from out-of-state locations in New York and New Jersey. In layman terms, fill material contains various levels of allowed contaminants and is classified either as clean or where higher levels of cont contaminants exist regulated. Over the past three years, I've had numerous meetings with concerned citizens and the PA Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, regarding these fill activities. During these meetings, one question has arisen again and again. If it's not good enough in New York and New Jersey, why do we allow it here? I share the same concerns, and I hope that today's hearing is a step in the right direction to ensure the health of our citizens is protected and our pristine environment is preserved. The Northeast region of Pennsylvania, which includes the 40th Senate District, is home to the highest concentration of exceptional value and high quality watersheds in the state. In fact, the Slate Belt has some of the highest quality water one could hope for. Nestle's Waters, for instance, draws out of the aquifer in Bangor, and we have many fish hatcheries in the area that thrive on our high quality water. Fishermen and women, from, fishermen and women from around the country fish in our high quality streams, and our residents rely on access to clean water. We want to find a balance between the interests of our citizens and business communities while protecting our environment. I look forward to hearing testimony today from the Pennsylvania Department of Protection, DEP, the Chamber of Commerce, area residents, elected officials, industry representatives, and thank you all for providing us with many viewpoints to consider. Mr. Chairman, so yes. Thank you. My job today is to keep us on schedule. We are on schedule. Now we just need to keep it there. Uh, to our, our first panel from the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, please make sure your microphone is turned on and please begin. Good morning. Um, thank you, Senator um, Argel and Senator Scavello, members of the committee. My name is George Hartenstein, Deputy Secretary for Waste, Air, Radiation, and Remediation for the Department of Environmental Protection. Thank you for the opportunity to appear to appear before you today to explain how fill is determined to be protective of public health and the environment. DEP recognizes the importance of regulating the use of fill 
particularly the use of fill from off-site sources in large construction projects. DEP's oversight role is primarily set by the Solid Waste Management Act, the Clean Streams Law, and the Land Recycling and Environmental Remediation Standards Act, known as the Land Recycling Act, or Act II. It is important to walk you through how the regulations, policies, and permits authorized by these statutes govern the use of fill in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania residual waste regulations define clean fill and establish that this material can be used to level or bring an area to grade without a permit if it is not placed in or on the waters of the Commonwealth or mixed with other wastes. DEP has further clarified the meaning of clean fill in the management of fill guidance first issued in 2004. The guidance specifies that uncontaminated soil, rock, stone, dredge material, used asphalt, brick, block, or concrete from construction and demolition activities that is separated from other wastes is clean fill. It further defines what is meant by the term uncontaminated, which I'll explain a little bit later in the testimony. The management of fill guidance also establishes another category of fill, regulated fill. Regulated fill is limited to soil, rock, stone, dredge material, historic fill, used asphalt, and brick, block, and concrete from construction and demolition activities that is separated from other wastes. Regulated fill can be beneficially used as a construction material under a general permit issued pursuant to the, salt, the um, residual waste regulations. Regulated fill can be used for improvements that are part of a construction project such as constructing berms or embankments, landscaping, building foundations, subbases for roads and parking facilities, uh, provided the material meets chemical concentration limits established in the permit. The, per the permit requires each new source of fill be sampled and analyzed for compliance before it can be used. The permit also prohibits the use of regulated fill for residential applications and includes siting limitations to ensure the placement of fill, regulated fill occurs within defined distance from streams, water sources, homes, and wetlands. The management of fill guidance applies to all areas of the Commonwealth except reclamation activities at non-coal mine sites that have an approved mining permit and reclamation plan. Because soil contains various chemical elements and substances from natural weathering of geologic formations, spills of waste and chemical products, uh, applications of fertilizers and pesticides, or emissions from vehicles and manufacturing operations, the terms uncontaminated and contaminated are not e easily distinguishable. DEP uses the Land Recycling Act as a basis for determining the levels of various inorganic and organic chemical substances that can be present in clean fill and regulated fill and that remain protective of human health. For material to qualify as clean fill, it must not be impacted by a release of a regulated substance, as that term is defined in Act II, or if it has, the soil must be tested to determine whether it meets levels that would be protective of human health under a residential exposure scenario as applied under the Act II statewide health standard. Cleanup of releases of regulated substances in soil for residential exposure is the most stringent application of the statewide health standard, as it allows for the unrestricted use of property. Therefore, it follows that such soil can be used in an unrestricted manner under the solid waste regulations as clean fill. To qualify as regulated fill, concentration limits of inorganic and organic related substances must not exceed levels that would be protective of human health under a non-residential exposure scenario as applied under the Act II statewide health standard. The Land Recycling Act, passed in 1995, establishes a risk-based approach to develop and remediation standards for soil and groundwater. The Act establishes a framework under which risk is mathematically calculated and fate and transport of substances in the environment is considered. Specific Act II regulations include, among other requirements, formula formulas that are used to calculate contaminant concentrations in soil and groundwater that meet this risk framework established in the Act. Since 1995, Act II cleanup standards have been applied to about 6,500 cleanups in Pennsylvania. The risk formulas contained in Act II regulations include many variables that are used to calculate risk including exposure assumptions such as intake 
frequency and duration factors, fate and transport assumptions such as organic ca carbon partitioning coefficients, as well as toxicity factors such as cancer slope values and reference dose th thresholds. The department worked with a cleanup standard scientific advisory board established in Act II in developing the regulations and applying them under the management of fill guidance. Many nearby states utilize a similar framework for risk-based cleanups of releases and the beneficial use of soil as fill. However, each state applies the many variables in the risk equations as well as applicability differently. Pennsylvania's management of fill guidance contains values for almost 400 organic and inorganic chemical compounds and elements. A comparison with other states would show that various compounds have levels that are lower and some that are higher than those calculated under Act II in Pennsylvania. A comparison would also show that fill in other states is limited in certain uses or applies to areas differently than how the management of fill guidance applies in Pennsylvania. Under Act II, DEP updates toxicity values and statewide health standards every three years so that the most recent science is available. DEP plans to propose updates to its existing management fill guidance in the coming months. The revisions are expected to be published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin for public comment later this year. The Department will consider all comments on the proposed revisions before issuing a final revised guidance. DEP is available to collaborate with the committee as we continue to work on the updates to the management of fill guidance. And I would be happy to answer any questions you have at this time. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Hartenstein. Um, first question, what are the testing standards the DEP uses to verify the fill clean, in, uh, that it's clean or not? How, when we, do we, when we go out to the sites, what do we do? So the uh, management of full guidance um, has uh, or contains some requirements for, for sampling material and, and, uh, and those include, you know, uh, that samples must be statistically representative of the source, the entire source that's going to be used for fill. Um, we have to meet specific laboratory um, analytical methods. Um, laboratories need to be accredited by DEP under, under Pennsylvania law. Um, and, the, and then the DP regional office also review um, shipping records and spot check the materials by sampling it and analyzing it at DEP's lab. How needed. often does that happen? Uh, it's, like, it's really as an ad, ad, it's kind of as an as needed basis. Because um, some of these sites are getting about 100 trucks a day from what I'm hearing. All right, uh, DP's Northeast regions, f the fill materials, most, you know, the, you know we have, from, that comes from New York and New Jersey. Uh, the dumping activity in the North poses, I believe, a risk to the high quality, exceptional value watersheds in the region. W what is your comment to that? Uh, well, both clean and regulated fill can't be used, placed in or on the waters of the Commonwealth. Okay. Um, so, and, and the equations under Act 2 for soil um, and, uh, anticipate and account for the, the uh, leaching from, from the soil of the, of the, comp, of the chemicals through uh, and into groundwater okay. into surface water. So they, 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 are, they account for that um, whenever we calculate the number. Uh, we, you know, we, we establish that as the protective level um, for, you know, for all, all soil, all, all cleanups of soil in the Commonwealth, so we believe they're protective. Okay. Uh, one last question. Um, we have these uh, slate quarries, deep holes, and f that are being filled now. What's the ch and you know there's water in some of them. What's to say that wells won't uh, see that down the road? What, whatever's going into the uh, into those quarries. Right. Well, I, I mean that's we whenever we're evaluating those kind of filling, actually filling a water body, they'll need a specific permit for their individual application uh, under a clean streams law. Uh, the, that um, situation has to be looked at, and, and we have to make sure that, that it is protective. Um, yeah. You know, our, our, again, our, our clean fill numbers are based on the assumption that the leachate will go through other layers of soil and, and, and be, um, and, and be um, captured by, by various soil particles. So we, we do need to understand that we just don't use the clean fill numbers directly into water 
and, and we'll need to evaluate each case. Yeah, you're going to hear from some of the uh, local officials in that area, and I think they're going to express that. I just one last question: Why would we be different than New York and New Jersey on the standards? You know that, and that I'm being asked that all the time by citizens in in the Slate Belt and and uh, also up in um, Monroe. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, th there are many variables in these equations that every state uses to calculate. We all use the same framework, the base, the, 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 the same type of, of formulas, but each of the variables can be very different. Mm -hmm. um, so some, so it, and it's just like a, um, you know, it's just like risk-based risk management in your financial portfolio. Everyone has a different, um, uh, whether they're conservative or, or more liberal interpret, you know, uh, a, a risk um, a, a level. Uh, so, so each state does things a little bit differently. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I guess that's the best answer I can give you. I, 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 well, let me phrase it just for a moment. If um, for example, we wanted to match those standards. Can DEP do that on their own? Because I, I, in most cases, I've seen you, uh, DEP, do things like that. Or do we need to do it legislatively? Should we want to go down that road? Well, we have we have established, again, equations, and it's it's you know Act Two directs DEP to establish regulations to, to evaluate risk uh, to human health from soil. So our regulations have been promulgated. We've had public comment. We have these standard equations, um, and we use our most stringent um, standards. Um, so I, I don't know that we, I mean, and, and those are consistent. Those are consist consistently applied across the state. They're applied for cleanups. They're, 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 they're applied for fill decisions. Um, and I'm not sure that um, that would be the best thing to do, but. Um, we, you know, we can certainly take a look at, but again, our, our, our whole po point, point in, in the regulations is to be consistent in how we calculate these for every single carcinogen, not, you know, not kind of do something differently for each one. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Hahn. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for being here to testify. You had talked about cancer slope values. So does DEP work with the Department of Health, and do they do studies? I know sometimes we get questions on um, cancer clusters, um, and, and I've worked with the Department of Health in the past to have studies done to show, and sometimes they'll come back and say, well, there's different types of cancers in the area, but not a cluster that they can attribute to one, to one factor. So does DEP work with the Department of Health? Do we look at those things on a regular basis? And I know it's not fair, you're not the Department of Health, but I'm just curious if you have any idea on, on how we handle that. Yeah, we, uh, the Department of Health has a, a grant with the Federal Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, ATSDR. Um, and part of that uh, grant is to look at um, environmental exposures to um, uh, various, you know, substances that could cause cancer or other diseases. Um, and, and on an individual by individual site basis, um, the, we, we will, we, we are invited to those meetings. We will um, identify sites where there's public concern, where that, where, and we will ask ATSDR to do a, um, through the Department of Health, to do a, a health assessment at a particular site. So we do get involved in those site-by-site -site things. Um, the, the cancer slope values we, we use um, when we calculate formulas, we use various databases. EPA has a database of toxic, toxic um, basic toxic references. Um, we use California's database. We use ATSDR's database. Um, so we use a number of different databases to find uh, an appropriate um, number to plug into our equations. To your knowledge, have there been any assessments done in the Slate Belt area? <clears throat> Excuse me, or, or uh, at any of the sites near here? I, I'm, I'm not aware. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not local, so. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Representative Emmerich. Thank you, Chairman uh, Argo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hartenstein, for your testimony today. Um, just a couple real quick questions. One, Senator Scabell had asked about the testing and inspection of the sites. So you said it's kind of a, on an as-needed basis. 
So what defines as needed? Is it a certain amount of time? Is it based on complaints that may come in? Um, where do those complaints come from? If somebody has a concern, um, does the average citizen have an opportunity to file a complaint? So could you help us with that? Sure. Uh, I, I, you know, our regional office staff will evaluate each case. I mean, again, we get um, reams and reams of analytical data on some of these large projects. I mean, they're, they're sampling, uh, you know, um, information is, is, is in large binders. Uh, so we, we certainly look at each source and the sampling that was done for that particular source. Uh, as it comes in, there's the, that's a separate check as it comes in on, on trucks and is deposited at the site. Um, and, and the regional staff will, you know, certainly if we have complaints, um, that, that's a cue. If we think if something looks close um, and we want, you know, on, on the paper that we receive from the source, that might trigger a need. Um, okay. Is it is it an issue of manpower with DEP? Is it, I mean, as Senator Scavella mentioned, we have some sites that have maybe up to 100 trucks a day coming in, and you're talking about just a, an incredible amount of fill. And if it's not getting tested on a, on a somewhat consistent basis, I think that's something that we would like to maybe look into and see changed if we could. So any recommendations you have moving forward with that would be appreciated. So um, just one more quick question. Um, the standards for PCBs, is the state of Pennsylvania do they have different standards than the EPA does at the federal level? Uh, yes, yes. Um, and it's a little bit of an explanation, but um, I'll give it a go. Okay. Um, EPA regulates PCBs under, under TOSCA, the Toxic Substances Control Act. That act, is, it, basically EPA uses that as a way to determine whether chemical pro chemicals should be in products and whether they should be prohibited from use. So EPA's numbers are based on, and specifically in the one instance that, that has gotten some attention, um, their number is based on whether the PCB is there or not, and whether that fill, that product is a PCB product, and whether it's um, prohibited from being used, just like a transformer would be prohibited from being used. That's their number. Our number is based on, uh, completely different, our number is based on a risk calculation of the risk to human health from the carcinogen. And we use, uh, we use various toxicity information the same way we use for every, any other carcinogen, uh, um, any other chemical, and we figure, and we determine what a concentration, a number in soil would be protective of human health for the exposure. So ours is, ours is different. Theirs is just, is it there or not? Ours is, is it protective of human health? Okay. So is it possible that our state's standards for PCBs are more stringent than the federal level, or in some cases less, or can it vary? Uh, EPA is, their, their number is based on total PCBs, so they measure, they, they measure everything, every PCB mixture and accumulate, cumulative. Uh, our numbers are based on each aerochlor mixture, so there's different mixtures, and the, depending on the chlorine, number of chlorine atoms in each mixture, it has different toxicity. Some of the aerochlor numbers are lower, our numbers are lower than EPA's two parts per million number. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are higher. Okay. So it, it, it kind of depends on which air chlor mixture is, is present at the site. Okay. All right. I think that helps. Thank you very much. Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Hartenstein, for your testimony. And just before we go for, further, can you um, give a definition of PCBs for the audience just so uh, we're, we're clear that everybody understands where we're at. Polychlorinated biphenyls okay. uh, is, the, is the name. Thank you. Name. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so I think the, <clears throat> excuse me, the questions are pretty much very much uh, similar uh, because at the root of, I think, this hearing is the differences and the variability that I'm sort of stuck on to say, you know, New York and New Jersey and how could we possibly have a difference? Uh, when you look and you say, how could there be a difference when it comes to a possible health concern or a possible, uh, you know, the use of fill? So I know we, in the first question with Senator Scavello, the variability piece you spoke about, <clears throat> can you go any further into that as far as the variability, um, even with um, 
Representative Emmerich, I know you mentioned a little bit, um, you know, about the federal level and the totals, but it, it just seems that there really shouldn't be this variability, especially within a region, a northeastern region at least. Um, and then on top of that, I'm, I'm wondering if you can clarify a little bit the commercial versus residential uh, is the differences a little bit more too, because um, throughout some of the acts, I think there was some commercial and residential differentiations, and I don't know if you can help us with that as well. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, um, each of the equations, um, and, and the, the, like I said, there's many different variables. Um, um, and basically what you're doing is you're taking health, various studies, very specific studies on like laboratory rats, and they're trying to figure out what is the, what is the dose of this particular chemical that won't ha cause any health effect. And so, you t so they're trying to figure that out, and then you have to take that, that number and look at the study and make a judgment about, well, how much... Is that, is, is, are, are humans going to be affected the same way that rats are <laughs> by that substance? Or, you know, should there be a, an additional, uh, should we use 80% versus 100% of that number? And so there's, there's uh, and that gets really into, into toxicology, and it's way more scientific than I can get into for sure here. Um, so, we, you know, we look at those, and each state is, you know, will do things differently. I mean, you probably could have five different toxicologists in a room and looking at the same chemical and come up with ten different numbers, um, depending on how you wanted to apply those. And, and then it gets a little bit more complicated. We apply our numbers to, you know, in a consistent way across the Commonwealth. New Jersey might only apply certain numbers to a cleanup site where they're bringing fill onto the site. Uh, where it's being cleaned up. Um, New York treats New York City differently than some other, other parts of the state, so there's different numbers that are being used in different areas for different uses, so it's, it gets very complicated fast. I know it's difficult, and I, and I think that that's where, you know, everyone is asking the questions, um, but just as if a study shows something is carcinogenic, it doesn't matter if you're in California or New York or New Jersey or Florida, it's carcinogenic. So that, that's where my, my mind is right now to say, you know, where are we and why are we different and, and why are the states so variable? I, I think when you have a study, it's a study now, especially if there's a broad amount of studies and it's not just one study. But uh, I think that's where I'm kind of going to be digging a little bit um, and, and hoping that maybe DEP will work with us strongly um, to look at some of, of what we're doing. Yep, Thank you. Certainly. Mr. Hartenstein, I'm, I'm sensitive to this issue because uh, I represent a lot of abandoned strip mines in, in Schuylkill County, and I, I recall uh, at a previous hearing like this, uh, it was explained in considerable detail that Pennsylvania is not allowed to say no to out-of-state materials simply because of where they come from that the United States Supreme Court has told us in no uncertain terms because we have tried, as have other states, that uh, violation of the Interstate Commerce Clause, that if Pennsylvania allows Pennsylvania material, we have to allow New Jersey, New York, whatever. I don't like the decision, but again, not a member of the Supreme Court. In terms of data, it would be very helpful if you could provide to my office, and then I will share with the, uh, my colleagues here today, I'm interested in the trends, where the regulated materials come from, New York, New Jersey, what other states, as compared to Pennsylvania, uh, materials that are coming here. And I'm curious if that is a stable trend, if it's declining, if it's increasing over the last five to ten years. But if you could provide that to us, that would be very helpful. Yes, we can. All right, thank you very much. We turn now to the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. Kevin Sunday is the Director of uh, Governmental Affairs. Yeah, 
Yeah, and you know how this works. In the interest of time, we'd prefer you to uh, summarize your uh, testimony. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Sunday, Director of Government Affairs with the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. We're the largest broad-based business advocacy organization in the Commonwealth. We represent nearly 10,000 members from all industrial and commercial categories, and they range in size from sole proprietorships to Fortune 50 companies. It's an honor to testify you before this uh, panel this morning on the state's approach to fill material and why it's so important to our economic uh, competitiveness. I appreciate the opportunity to provide the business perspectives on this matter. Uh, our goal regarding waste management is twofold. One, we want to promote economic development via sustainable innovation, including the reuse of materials. And two, we want to ensure when the, something is a waste, it's handled, processed, treated, stored, and disposed of in a manner that protects the environment and public health. There are some other speakers today who will discuss a specific regulatory approach that's been taken across the state, but I want to take a step back and frame this issue from a statewide economic and, and environmental uh, standpoint. First, let me say, uh, Senators Argo and Scavella, we appreciate and applaud your vote in 2013 for Act 89, the Comprehensive Transportation Funding Bill that's allowing us to rebuild roads and bridges across the state, as well as invest in ports, airways, railways, bike paths, recreational areas, and transit. It was your intent to build and rebuild this state's roads and bridges, and that's good common sense public policy. It's also good for business, which is why we supported Act 89 through the finish line. And I would, I would note that to your great credit, other states are looking to what Pennsylvania did with Act 89 as a model to fund their infrastructure needs. And you might be asking, what does that have to do with the clean fill policy? Well, I would say that on the topic of building roads and bridges, if we take too conservative, overly aggressive approach to waste management, it makes it very hard, if not outright prohibitive, to build new roads and bridges. And the nexus there is that when we're talking about fill, it's not uh, com commercial demolition waste, but uh, concrete, asphalt, brick, rock, soils, and other materials that's, that's used in other bridges and roads that are being torn down and need to be brought to another site. Uh, as new projects are being built, whether that's a new roadway or a new development, the landscape needs contoured and shaped. And so you bring in the materials from somewhere else to, uh, to build that site. And it's been our position at the chamber, as well as uh, the past several uh, governor's administrations, that we ought to use materials for beneficial use. So if they're not needed someplace, they can go somewhere else. Uh, but in order to do that safely, DEP has to draw a line between material that can be beneficially used and material that's a waste. And if we determine that it's a waste, it, it is still going somewhere, likely a landfill, and our landfills have limited capacity. Um, if it's not a landfill, there are some expensive treatment options out there, but they can be very prohibitive and, and render the project economically non-viable. Um, and if we don't have uh, the, the allowance for beneficial reuse, you're going to start talking about digging up greenfield pristine spaces to get the soil to shape the site. And, and now we have more land development considerations brought into the fore. So all that said, we need to take a balanced path. Uh, DEP has been at this for 20 odd years trying to figure out exactly how to shape the policy right. And we've worked with them throughout that process and the legislature. And there's been a host of revisions which I've outlined in the testimony. But generally, the department has a conservative approach that's based on risk to the public health, as Deputy Secretary Hartenstein just laid out, and that's an approach that we support. Um, so again, the question is what we do moving forward and how sensitive to risk do we want to be? Uh, it's, a, it's a question of public policy, which is why we applaud you for having this committee today to hear voices from all, all perspectives. Uh, but again, if we take an approach that's overly sensitive, to deal with uh, the concerns about out of state, understand there's a lot of in-state implications that we'll have uh, as a result of that. Again, the transportation is one, land development of new projects is another, uh, repairing and restoring our roads and bridges, um, taking old brownfield sites, which were industrial sites that were laid waste, you might need uh, to bring in fill from there to make the site able to be reused. Uh, we, we've had an open dialogue with the department and the legislature throughout this. This is an, just another um, bit of evidence of that. We appreciate that, uh, that openness. And we are happy to continue to stay engaged and coordinated with you as you move forward on this issue. So with that, I, I thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, thank you for your t uh, testimony, Kevin. One question, and, and the most of the concern in the Northeast, in our area here, comes from Phil that's coming from out of state. 
And with D, and I should have asked this to DEP, but we have another, another sp uh, spokesperson for DEP coming up right after you. Um, the concern is, are we testing it uh, frequently? Um, suppose, as a possibility, increasing the fees so that we can hire a couple of people that could be at these sites regularly to, to uh, take samples, check loads, because if you live nearby, you don't know. Your mind is thinking you don't know what's going in there. And rather than the spot checks, and you really don't know when that's going to happen. And we know where the sites are. There's quite a bit in Carbon. There's one in Whitehall. There's uh, Hamilton Township in Monroe and he's a school co we know where these sites are and if if it if it comes to putting more uh, staff on to be able to make sure the ones that are coming from out of state are the ones that really concern me more than anything else what would you say sure i mean at the chamber we we've, we've never said just no outright to more funding for the department when we have these fee conversations we want to get a good understanding from the department of what the current needs are and what the workload is as as you do and and your work with appropriations and the other committees um, I'd say that's, that's something we're open to discussing further. I think it's important that the sampling, in fact, make, is representative of whatever is being brought in. Again, the question is how much sampling is appropriate, and that's something that we're going to have to continue to have. It'll be a topic of when DEP puts these clean fill policies out for, uh, for comment later this year. Okay. Thank you. Representative Hahn. Thank you, Chairman. Do we have any idea of how many um, trucks are coming that are in state and what the volume is coming in from out of state? And do, as the chamber, do you know if it's what it would be like across the state? So are we seeing in Erie, Pittsburgh, or trucks coming in from Ohio and other areas like they are here? Do we have any idea as far as uh, business-wise? I, I wouldn't have an answer for that off the top of my head, but I can, I can check in with the folks that are chamber members that work in that space to get a better idea for you. All right, because we're a border state, so you know, I'm just wondering. But I know they're going to the chairman's area as well in Schuylkill. But um, you know, I'm just concerned. Are they just all coming in here from New York, New Jersey, and what are other states doing and bringing in here? And wondering how it affects us. Sure, and that's again, I, I wouldn't want to say it's just because it's out of state. It must be worse than what's in state. I think we we favor a level playing field regulatory approach um, that's that's going to allow developers to have flexibility to move forward with their projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is our citizens panel, uh, Ty Bartosz, Paul Smith, and Stephen Toth. When you begin, please be sure that the uh, microphone is turned on, and if you could identify the, uh, the organization that you're testifying on behalf. Hello? All right. Okay, my name is Ty Bartosh, and I'm owner and operator of Greenwalk Chow Hatchery in Bangor, Pennsylvania. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today to testify. Okay, I'm going to start just with a little history. Um, in 1950, my grandfather chose the location for Greenwalk Chow Hatchery in Bangor, PA because of the pure spring water that flowed from the secluded hemlock covered forest. In 1979, he decided to go into the spring water business and started trucking spring water to a bottling company in New Jersey while still raising over 250,000 of the most beautiful trout to be in stocked in waters from Delaware to Massachusetts for the sport of fishing. He believed everybody deserved the right to enjoy recreational activities, fishing being one that many can enjoy. Without clean water, none of this is possible. 
Today we're here to talk about the practices of importing clean fill and regulated fill into our state, into the slate belt, and directly into our aquifers. For those of you that do not understand what a slate core is, let me explain a little. A slate core is a giant man-made hole in the ground, some up to a thousand feet deep. These giant holes in the ground were man-made in order to extract slate for roofing, chalkboards, and many other things that slate is used for. The slate quarries have been here for over a hundred years, some of them. And not many are still used today are now, and are now filled with water. Even though, even though these are man-made and were not natural to our environment, they are now very important to our local watersheds. Now they are giant points of entries to our local aquifers and man-made ecosystems. And many other organisms they are home to fish, birds, turtles, snakes, microinvertebrates, and many other organisms that have to be protected, as well as the water. A few years ago, there was a project upstream from us where an abandoned quarry hole was to be filled with the, uh, the overburden, the, the garbage slate that couldn't be used, and they were going to put it back into the hole. Uh, it, the project was funded by a Growing Greener grant and was to be the flagship of what to do with all these abandoned quarry holes. This was a great idea, many people thought. We did not agree with this and made our concerns to the town, known to the township and to the property owners. We told them this might affect our water. We have been here for over 60 years and rely on this crystal clear spring water. Well, the project was started and within a year or so, I started to see a difference in the water. Trout are sort of like the canary birds that are in cages that they used to use in coal mines in West Virginia years ago to check the air quality. The trout don't lie. I saw a difference in the water quality, a higher mortality in my eggs and fry and young trout. I have lived on this property my whole life and am very in tune with the nature around me. I feel the water every day, and I can hear the change in the flows from spring to summer, and I truly care about Mother Nature and all creatures big and small. Luckily, we have an extensive history on our property and have tested the water for many years to stay in compliance of state and federal laws. The flow of the water varies with the seasons, but the quality of the water never changes it has been a constant high quality for all the years since my grandfather started back in 1950. Now I knew we had a problem. And the only thing that has changed was the quarry fill project above us, where the slate was being pushed back into the hole and into the aquifer. My worst fears have now become a reality. Now what? The fear of the unknown is the worst. Would I wake up one day to the sight of 250,000 dead fish? and 60 plus years of my family's hard work down the drain, all because of the government's decision to roll the dice on the most precious thing we have on this earth, water. Without water, there is no life. The project has since stopped, the years roll by and the water continues to flow, and it has stabilized. But still I am bothered by the unknown. I think it's very simple. The water has to be protected at all costs. I love our state, the slate belt, but most of all, I love this earth. It's our job to protect its watersheds. Now I understand, I, I do understand the economic side of the equation and do not want to stand in the way of any business trying to make its own way in this world. But there's a fine line, a balance between making money and taking care of the environment. We cannot afford to roll the dice any longer, find a better place to dump the so-called clean fill somewhere away from water and definitely not directly into the aquifer. There is no future without clean water. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Smith. <clears throat> I'm a resident of uh, Hamilton Township, Monroe County. I live in Greenview uh, Drive, right across from a dump site. Uh, my bio is in the major papers. You can see my background. 
Let me just highlight the key points that I think is essential. This, a uh, little bit about the history. This has been going on for 26 years. It started in 1992 to the current time, 2018. Um, they were mining shale and slate back in 1992. The current operator back then uh, had a, a major problem with the disposal of arsenic, uh, vicocious black petroleum substances, um, various uh, organic compounds, and benzopyrene coal tar. The human harm on any of these products is that it affects your red blood cell, causes damage, it causes uh, anemia, suppresses the immune system, and causes cancer. Now this dump site was used uh, originally for mining. They, were, they ran out of product and they started accepting material from other areas, possibly New Jersey, possibly New York, or even possibly local. Uh, the DEP was involved as far as the violations. Back in June 5th of 2009, they had a illegal disposal of solid waste in, in, in stoppage. I was involved with Dean Fisher and Walter uh, Gern. They were supervisors of solid waste management. Um, we contacted Hamilton Township to tell them what was going on and nobody seemed to be concerned at that particular time. Uh, they eventually sold the property in 2002 to another operator, and I'm not going to mention particular names today. Uh, this particular operator uh, was uh, immediately uh, told by the DEP to immediately cease and uh, dumping any material. He uh, had a problem of um, posting no, no dumping signs, and removing uh, any property. He had to remove the ground soil. He had to remove at least 15 feet of product. Uh, the county of Monroe fined this gentleman June 17, 2011. Um, they sentenced him six months of uh, sen suspended sentence, a $5,000 fine, and he had to pay $35 a month. Uh, any one of these truck operators are getting $1,000 a truck to bring that material in. It's quite a uh, lucrative operation for any operator to move hazardous waste and stuff like that. Um, the new operator bought the property in 2014, and um, they're starting to dump uh, material on the rate of uh, two trucks every 10 minutes. That's 120 trucks an hour. Uh, if you look at the number of trucks per week, you're talking at 65,000 tons of dump site material that's coming into our property. Now, I live across the street. I'm on a well and a septic system. I spend a lot of money for my property. If my well is contaminated, my property is of no value to me, to my family, and to the surrounding neighborhood. And we have approximately 75 residents that are affected by this dump site. Uh, we've had community meetings. We've met with the township hierarchy. Uh, we've met with Senator Scavello and Rosemary Brown. Uh, we're concerned because if we lose our wells, we won't be able to sell our property. We won't even be able to move out of the area. We'd have to have all water trucked in. This is no different than Niagara Falls in Love Canal or other major contaminated areas. I've been involved in five Fortune 500 corporations in my career over 42 years. I've handled hazardous waste material shipments. I represented my company in Washington, D.C. before the Interstate Commerce Commission and the National Agricultural Chemical Association. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a major concern for Northampton County, for Monroe County. If you lose your well, where are you going to get water to drink and bathe? And the other thing is that who's going to protect my family if we become ill? Where's the representation? It's nice to have rules and regulation, but if the environmental people aren't doing anything to stop this kind of dumping, 
we're all going to be suffering from this in the future. So I, I respect having this opportunity to speak before the committee. I think it's essential that you're having this meeting. It's critical that uh, people understand what's going on and they need more community activity to get involved with their state senators and representatives. Thank you. Hello, my name is Steve Toth. I represent East Bangor. I am president of the town council for the last nine of my 10 years on council. Uh, I would like to thank Senator Scavello's office and his staff for all their input and in helping us with this, especially Taylor Munez, who's been instrumental to me. He sends me soil sample reports all the time so I know, keep up on what's going on. I know about PCBs. I've been in the chemical business until retirement recently for 30 years. I spent 18 years with Mitsubishi Chemical, and I spent 12 and a half years with Polytech Development Corporation. I can tell you firsthand, PCBs are really bad, along with a lot of the other chemicals that are associated with it. Our problem in East Bangor is we do have some wells on one side of it, where residents live, and they have many concerns about their wells also. We also have a creek below it called Brushy Meadow Creek that flows into Bangor. And on the other side, we have East Bangor Dam, a fishery that's been there since before me. Now, VIP is moving closer to East Bangor Dam. The project was approved by EPA, but still in all, we have concerns about runoff. The DEP's redemation program seems like a mission statement. At the end, it says, no risk to environment or human health. Well, where does human health begin and end? How about the noise? How about the people who live close to this project with the bumping and the dumping and the noise associated with the trucks who keep people up at night and the dust and dirt? They have tried all they can by plowing, the, uh, taking care of the road and spraying but still in all. How about the infrastructure, the roads deteriorating from all the truck traffic? And there is a lot of it. Just recently, my wife went two miles from my house to Mount Bethel, and she said 15 trucks came down the road on the other side. That's just in a two-mile stretch. Originally, when I first got involved with this, it was said maybe 60 to 70 trucks. They have 60 to 70 trucks an hour. They one time told us they were going to run 24-7. Really? Do you know how much soil is going to be dumped in that amount of time? And who's going to check it? We don't know if it's being checked. We get sporadic testing. At one time, there was a big area that was contaminated. It was never removed for a long time. People who were asking questions decided, well, they're probably just going to let nature take its course, either rain, snow runoff, sun, or eventually evaporate or it'll leach into the ground. Eventually, this contaminated material was moved, but after a long period of time, and then they said underneath was clean. We don't know. I, again, think that there should be more testing. At one time, our previous mayor, I've been through three of them now, he had people come in and test on site. That's a limited, very limited, and it's only taken off a spot on the truck. We have to rely on reports that are given a whole other state away. And this is how this all came about. When I go to all these meetings and the DEP told us that's Senator Scavello's office, don't blame the DEP for your problems. Your problems start in Harrisburg. They're the ones that set the standards, and that's what we're here about today, isn't it? Change these standards. Why is a federal PCB at one or two and everybody else comes right in under us? We did not, East Bangor did not solicit this project. It was shoved down our throats by opportunist company who saw an open door and was approved by the standard that DEP allowed. And now East Bangor is stuck with it. Let me tell you, anybody who has any kind of a hole in your area, fill it in now. Because once these companies get a hold of it, you cannot stop them. This is going to go on for a long time for us. And we live with it every day. 
Sure, VIP has helped us in the past, but they don't live in our town. We are the ones that live in our town. We are the ones that put up with this every single day. And I, I just hope things do improve, really, and water quality does not suffer for it. Because like this gentleman said, when the water is gone, it's done. You know, it, it, there's water and land. Once it's gone, it's gone. You cannot replace it. As far as the noise goes, I could go on and on and on about the trouble with the trucks. One of the trucks even ran into a train. How do you do that? You hit with a train with a dump truck. Unbelievable. The trucks that come down the hill are on the wrong side of the road. My wife and I don't travel through East Bangor if we're in Penargel because the trucks coming down, they run out across the line, push people into the curbs. No one cares. We go to the back road just to avoid these trucks. And that's how it's going to be probably long after I'm here. So in closing, I would like to say thank you to everybody for the concern and give me this time and this to opportunity to voice my concerns. Thank you. And thank you, gentlemen. As Se Senator Scavello knows me well, uh, I've done some uh, part-time uh, college teaching at uh, Penn State, and one of the subjects that really intrigues me is distrust of government. We talk about it a lot in my, my public policy classes, and so I just one, one question for each of you. Uh, in, in my class, we, I'll ask them, well, when did people start distrusting their government? And some of my younger students will say, well, they didn't like something that President Obama did uh, or, or President Bush on Iraq. Uh, in my generation, of course, there was no doubt that government misled people regarding things like Watergate and Vietnam. But and then I'll take them back to the Declaration of Independence and have them read it and remind them that the people in this state have never trusted their government and sometimes for good reason. I'm, I'm curious in this case, the environmental standards, I have seen them strengthened again and again and again since the, the, the first Earth Day. And, and we have made some serious progress. But if what I, I think I heard from each of you, and I'd like you to verify it, you're worried that the current standards may not be strict enough. That's the first half of the question. And the second half of the question is, perhaps more importantly, you're afraid that in many cases the standards are not going to be adequately enforced, that you're worried about midnight dumpers coming in when no one is looking and no one is regulating. Is, is that the concern, that the standards are not strict enough and that they will not be enforced to the proper standard? Just, it's a simple in, yes or no from, I think, in, each In the of case you. of East Bangor, there it is, it happened. Okay. It's already there. That's why this dumping is going on in East Bangor, because of the standards, for no other reason. Okay. They took advantage of it. And okay. the reason I'm also uh, worried about it is for my children and my grandchildren and their children and their grandchildren and everybody else who comes before them. Now, I'm the senator for a lot of abandoned strip mines, so I understand completely. Go ahead. Senator, um, the DEP... Uh, it's taken samples of the material across the street from where I live. The proper soil testing is taking core samples with an auger at least six to eight feet deep in order to get a proper sample. You don't climb up in the back of a truck with a cup and take a soil sample to see if there's any contaminants. It's not being enforced, number one. Number two is that when I get up in the middle of the night on a Saturday morning at 2.30 and hear them dumping, what are they dumping on a Saturday night at 2.30 in the morning? Something that they don't want to be uncovered. There's no other reason that you operate Monday to Friday, 8 to 5. When you operate on a Saturday morning, and I'm not the only neighbor that's heard it because I've checked with my other neighbors, they hear it too. And then I have neighbors on the left and right of me, they have black water, their water smells, and they're concerned about chemicals in the water. We're all concerned because there's going to be one heck of a lawsuit against the township, the county, and the state if we run into another Love Canal. Okay. Right. Well, um, I think the standards have to be higher, but I don't think that's the biggest problem. With our situation and the project that affected us, the only reason that we found out this was going on was because of our testing, you know, privately. The DEP and whoever was in charge of checking the standards of that water 
did absolutely nothing until we brought it to their attention. So the, the enforcement's a joke. I don't rely on the government, never will. I, we take care of our own. You know, we found it, not the government. Okay. So the testing's a joke. Thank you. I want to thank all three of you gentlemen, and this hearing is as a result of the three of you. We, with with uh, Paul, we met with Representative Brown. We had that hearing over in the Pocono Township Municipal Building, and uh, we put some parameters in place, and the municipality was there, and I'm assuming, Paul, that you know, the wells are being tested. The, there'd be grant money available and, and to Hano, uh, Hamilton Township to make those adjustments. To, so I'm, I'm assuming that's happening. But Paul, you said something that really concerns me. And, and, and actually, it's in your notes, and that's A. Is you, you're saying that the description of the items that you mentioned, are you saying that they, that wasn't cleaned up back in 92, from 92 on? When the second operator was operating, um, he was uh, fine for contamination, and he was re required to remove the soil that he had uh, put there. Uh, he was supposed to bring in a screening machine to screen the material. That was uh, a rental cost of about $27,000 a month that he didn't want to pay, and he uh, did not take any of the waste material out of the property. That's still there, so it's been sitting there, and it's been covered up for the last five or six years with other dirt and other materials that they're dumping on top. We sit between Pencil Creek and McMichael's mm -hmm. Creek. I know we are, yeah. That Paul, water is going to go down and contaminate yeah. both yeah. of those major streams, their trust streams. Paul, why wasn't this brought up at the hearing that we had? Because this is the first time. I, I knew that there was a history there, but my assumption was that it was cleaned and that that site was cleaned before they even increased. You know, because I, I, this to me is important. I'm very concerned about what you have here. That the, that. I want to make sure that this site was cleaned, and that's basically... Well, I think if you check, you'll find out it was not cleaned. DEP has all the records. That's why they shut down that second operator's okay. permit so that he couldn't operate anymore. Okay. And the third operator's doing the same thing. He's just dumping the other stuff that he's bringing in right on top of the old fill. Okay. I th thank you. I, all three of you, I want to really thank you because you're the, you, you, without your information, we wouldn't know the stuff. And I, I tie and met with you and you explained that and uh, um, that's what this is all about, to find out what's going on. As far as, you know, I asked, if you heard, I asked DEP, can, he, can they make that standard change on their own or do we have to legislate? Uh, and I believe that they can. I just, they're here listening and hopefully, um, it might, that's probably be the fastest way, basically. Yes, I'd like Paul. to say something uh, concerning our township. I spoke with their lawyer, <clears throat> and he asked me to count the number of trucks that are coming every day and report to him what I found. That's not my responsibility. You, you have markers and methods to truck activity on a particular road. They put uh, counters. counters across the road. They could tell how many trucks are coming to verify. He has a limit of 25 trucks a day. Now, he's exceeded that many, many times. Mm -hmm. Who's checking that? Nobody yeah. but me. As a result of that hearing, that's what brought the counters out there, why they're weighing trucks and all. You know, I just want you to know that you are seeing activity, and, and I believe DEP is you're seeing DEP quite, quite often as well, as a result of that hearing. But that they, Senator, they have spotters that know when the police are there to check the weight of the trucks and when they're running, and they have trucks coming that they're clean and the weight is within legal limits. A lot of that stuff, why are they sweeping uh, every Tuesday and Saturday, Thursday and then watering down the road unless they're afraid of something that's being contaminated? That road was a pristine road, Greenview Drive. It was repaved back in 2005. And right today, that road is potholes, cracks, and it's disgraceful the way that the trucks have ruined that road. Who's responsible for that? The state, the county, the township? I don't know. I can't get answers. Okay. Representative Emmerich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Thank you very much for your, your testimony today. It's just absolutely outstanding. 
and uh, Senator Scavello and Chairman Argo, thank you for having them here. Um, you know, as a couple of you know, not Mr. Smith, um, but I grew up right in the area in Washington Township, just a short distance from Green Walk and uh, have a long history there of my dad taking me there to see the trout when I was a little, little kid in the 70s. Hate, hate to give away my age, but, uh, but back in the 70s and uh, he really got me into trout fishing and the outdoors and man, a week before trout season I couldn't sleep at night. So, um, so you, you really are an icon, not just for the whole slate, but especially the Bangor area. Uh, I can you. testify to that personally. Um, and to Mr. Toe, thank you for your testimony and all the impact that this has had. I know we've talked about it uh, in East Bangor. Just two things I want to I want to say. Um, we've met with the state police on a couple of different occasions with a program that that we've started in our office called Safe and Scenic 611 in an effort to try and control some of this truck traffic. One of the other concerns that wasn't really brought up was the overweight trucks coming in and all the things like that. So we've actually had the state police do some enforcement um, unannounced obviously and unexpected and you know one of the problems they've told us so we're continuing to work with them uh, through that process uh, one of the one of the issues they have is that as soon as they go out and get started all the trucks radio back and then they either reroute or they just stop coming for the day um, so instead of coming across the Portland Columbia Bridge they'll just stay on 80 come across up in the representative Brown's district and go into Whitehall or someplace else and uh, so we are continuing to work on that side uh, moving forward. And then on uh, back to the original issue, um, and probably the other elected officials here aren't aware, but um, Chairman Argo and, and everybody, that there was an issue in Bangor a few years ago on the old incinerator site where there was a significant amount of material dumped illegally and it was contaminated. And that site basically borders the East Bangor Borough at the old Bangor incinerator site. And it's just a couple hundred yards from where VIP is doing the, the filling of the, of the uh, quarry hole now. Um, so we in the Bangor area especially are incredibly sensitive to this issue, the potential contamination of the water supply and making sure we protect you know, the value, valuable, valuable assets of the community and certainly people's wells and, and the water supply in general. So I just wanted to make that comment. And again, thank you very much for all your testimony today. Can I just remind you also of American Fuel Harvesters project in East Bangor that was shut down years ago. How many problems that we have with that? And that's, that's a big blight and eyesore now. It'll never be anything but what it is, a big pile of junk. And I think I mentioned earlier that once that trust has been lost, it's, it's really difficult to, to rebuild it. On my drive here today, I, I crossed streams that, that ran orange and were incredibly uh, polluted uh, on, uh, in the 1940s and the 1950s. Today people are fishing in them. So I've seen it work in the other direction as well. Uh, I've seen mountains outside of Tamaqua that were incredibly scarred by unregulated uh, coal mines that, that turned green uh, within the last 10 years for the first time in anyone's memory. Uh, and so the, it can work, but we need to be vigilant and we need to make sure that the standards are where they should be. Thank you again, gentlemen, very much. We turn now, Valley Industrial Properties, RT Environmental Services and Barnsdale Associates. Mm -hmm. While the uh, testifiers are coming up, I'd like to make a uh, first, and I apologize, we didn't expect to know, we didn't expect as many folks that, that have showed up. So the agenda will be available on the S Senate Republican website. If you go to my website, you'll be able to get a link right to it so you can get an agenda. Uh, also, this will be filmed, this, this, this whole process is being filmed and it should be on PCN uh, in the next week, if not this week. Um, the other thing, there are a lot of comments being made, and I've, we've asked a couple of questions, and I want to have DEP, who is in the room, follow up on some of those comments that were made. I want answers, and I'm sure every one of you want the answers as well. And those, that, when we get that response, that will also be up on my, on my website. Gentlemen. 
Uh, good morning, Chairman Argyle and uh, Senator Scavello and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Brian Hilliard and I'm the Director of Compliance for a few companies, uh, Valley Industrial Properties, uh, Copley Aggregates, and Portland Properties. And I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today regarding our experiences with the Pennsylvania Regulatory Program uh, pertaining to the use of fill materials. Our companies specialize in the restoration and redevelopment of brownfields and abandoned mine properties by bringing them back to viable use, typically as commercial industrial parks. Historically, we have subdivided and developed properties for use as service stations, commercial office space, heavy equipment dealership uses. We've also redeveloped on a limited basis property for residential use. In connection with our restoration and redevelopment activities, we applied for and maintain the proper environmental permits as required by the Pennsylvania DEP to conduct those activities. Our environmental work allows for an economic benefit by bringing brownfields and abandoned mine properties back to life as higher value use properties with increased tax revenues for local municipalities and employment opportunities for local workers. The properties that we've revitalized are the result of former industrial activity. They left behind unsafe conditions such as high walls, unstable stone surfaces, and open water. Every year there are many drownings at similar properties and state and federal agencies conduct outreach and use taxpayers' money to reclaim such abandoned properties. The work of restoring these abandoned properties to productive use is expensive, and it involves extensive permitting and development activities, including the construction of the necessary infrastructure and improvements. We are making such investment in the properties that we own in order to develop them as the local zoning allows. We strive to work closely with the local municipalities regarding the reuse plans and offer an open door policy. Our redevelopment activities, particularly involving in abandoned mine properties, typically require the importation of large amounts of fill material to enable the property to be brought back to restored to use. We use fill material that's classified as clean fill under the requirements established by DEP. We also use, in particular circumstances, fill material that is classified as regulated fill by DEP. We are authorized to use regulated fill material under a general permit issued by DEP pursuant to the Solid Waste Management Act in order to obtain the authorization to accept regulated fill material under this general permit, we must submit a detailed application to DEP, and DEP in turn reviews the application and makes a decision to grant or deny the application. In addition, DEP reviews and pre-approves each source of- Brian, could you pull that closer oh, to you, please? Sorry. Is that better? No, closer. That okay, better? good. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, in addition, DEP reviews and pre-approves each source of regulated fill material that we use. Under DEP's management of fill policy, uh, which we've heard about a little bit today, clean fill material is, is material such as soil, rock, brick, block, and concrete, which is inert, you know, that has not been impacted by a release or regulated substances or contains any regulated substances. But at concentrations below the established numeric limits that DEP has determined to be protective of human health and the environment. Clean fill is considered unregulated and can be generally used in any setting, including residential. By contrast, regulated fill material that contains regulated substance at concentrations above the clean fill limits but below an alternative standard that's set forth in the permit. The alternative standards have been determined by DEP to be protective of human health and environment based on a non-residential use of the property receiving the regulated fill. Our properties that are authorized to receive regulated fill material are all non-residential and are planned for future use as commercial industrial parks. Under the management of fill policy and the general permit for use of regulated fill, we conduct thorough reviews of the history, site history, and use of the or, or, excuse me, and use of the origin of the fill material. We also review testing and any other pertinent information regarding the quality of the fill material. These sites usually have environmental oversight by the state environmental agencies, including Pennsylvania, and also have third-party engineering firms that are required to review and certify the work. If there is a potential for any impact to the fill material, we require the material be tested at the source uh, in compliance with the management of fill policy. These sampling plans are developed based on the established site characterization standards developed by DEP and the EPA, where we use systematic gr gridding of the site and use of random sampling to ensure unbiased results. This process is lengthy and detailed, uh, can including up thousands of pages of documents. Once we've gathered an extensive amount of due diligence and believe the material to meet the requirements is either clean or regulated, we submit this information to DEP. In turn, DEP reviews this information, provides us with an approval or review question seeking further explanation. 
This process is fully completed and any outstanding questions are resolved prior to accepting the material at our facilities. I hear a lot of statements about not testing material, but we pre-qualify all the sources of material prior to acceptance. Each load of fill material is transported with appropriate shipping papers, such as a bill of lading or manifest, that provides specific information to enable every shipment to be tracked. This process ensures traceability from the site of origin to the receiving site. These tracking documents are used both by the generator and the receiving facility to track the loads and confirm proper receipt. Transportation of fill material at our facility is primarily the responsibility of our clients. The person or entity supplying the fill material is made aware of the routes to our facility and the rev relevant federal and state laws. While we share concerns about the potential that fill material might be shipped in overweight vehicles, the delivery of fill material is out of our control until the shipment arrives at our facility. We, however, developed an internal penalty system that is in place for any trucks that are not compliant, and this system has significantly improved compliance. The trucking industry is regulated by other agencies um, that they would have to do. Uh, we own, one of the differences, we own all the properties where we conduct our activities, and our, we are the environmental steward for the use of those properties. Because we are the owners of properties where the fill material is used, we have every incentive to make sure the fill material that we receive is properly beneficially used. We strive to maintain complete compliance with all permits and regulations. In a few instances where an issue has occurred, we have immediately addressed the issue and resolved it to the satisfaction of the regulatory agency in question. In the unlikely case of a major environmental issue, we maintain a site-specific environmental insurance policy of our, uh, which we're not required to have of up to $6 million to be available to address the issue. The use of fill material is vital to the restoration and redevelopment of brownfields and abandoned mine properties. Pennsylvania's program protects human health and the environment while facilitating the conservation of resources by enabling the various types of fill material to be safely reused. In the absence of this program, fill material would need to be mined from greenfield sites with the attendant environmental concerns that such activities bring, while fill, fill material could be safely reused, would instead likely to be diverted to landfills and take up the scarce landfill capacity. Uh, thank you for your opportunity to provide the testimony, and I'll be willing to answer questions afterwards. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um, my name is Walter Hungarter. I'm with uh, RT Environmental Services. I'm a uh, vice president there. Um, my firm has been working with the uh, Department of Environmental Protection for a very long period of time. Uh, the first clean fill policies came out uh, back in the 1996 time frame. Um, the clean fill policy that we're currently working under is the uh, 2004 version which was modified in 2010 of the clean fill policy. Uh, my firm has worked um, with doing sampling at sites, doing investigation work, and clearing materials for both regulated and uh, unregulated fill material. Um, we've had a very successful working relationship with the Department of Environmental Protection over the, uh, the many years the firm has been involved. Um, some of the things I'm gonna highlight from my comments um, are gonna relate to the policy itself uh, and how we need to establish some uh, guidance in the policy uh, between background condition at a site or a naturally occurring contaminative concern versus a contaminative concern related from a spiller release. Um, some of the things that we find um, doing this testing is, and I'm gonna give some examples, we'll come across a site where there's arsenic and there's certain portions of the state, certain materials which have naturally occurring concentrations of arsenic which are actually higher than the Pennsylvania statewide health standards. In, in those situations, uh, it's very difficult um, to, to say that the material is clean fill, uh, that you can use it on a site because it exceeds the current policy standards. Um, there has to be a mechanism that the department needs to consider uh, on how to document what is a naturally occurring concentration versus a, a spiller release. Uh, in many instances, um, no one is going to go out there and distinguish between a spill and release versus naturally contaminated, which means that material is going to be managed as a waste, taken off site and put into a landfill and taking up valuable airspace. Uh, a lot of times, if you have a uh, arsenic concentration of 19 at one property and you want to move that material to another site where the arsenic concentration is 19, you wouldn't be able to do that under the current policy. Uh, I think that's something that the, as the department moves forward with the uh, consideration of changes under the policy, that that should be uh, reviewed and looked at. Um, some of the other things, I'm just gonna highlight two more things, I know we have some time constraints here. Um, 
Mr. Hartenstein indicated that there are situations where the numeric numbers for the Act II program will change. And those changes could be higher or lower for different constituents of concern, um, depending on uh, when that material is placed. Uh, right now, they are currently using a three-year review cycle for constituents. Um, the question that, that I think the department needs to help look at here, um, if it's placed, if clean fill is determined to be clean fill on Monday, the policy goes into effect on Tuesday. Now that material that was placed on Monday is no longer clean fill. Um, there are situations where that is going to happen, and if we, without putting something in the policy to address that, you're, you're going to have a lot of unhappy um, property owners who now have an environmental problem on their site because material that was placed is not currently clean fill. Um, I know the last point I'd like to just talk, touch on real quick is, I know there's been a lot of talk about uh, abandoned mines. Um, right now, the, uh, the abandoned mines kind of sit out in no man's land. Um, there's a, a lot of safety issues associated with those. Um, clean fill can be successfully used. Um, I think Mr. Hartenstein indicated earlier that they have some uh, permitting processes to go through there. Um, I think it's a matter of making sure that the clean fill is appropriate to use in those situations. I think if we have something in the policy that says um, you can use this in an abandoned mine project, uh, the clean fill would be fine so long as you have permits, so long as you have taken all the appropriate steps the department requires to make sure that there are no issues. Um, my, my last comment here is I just want to thank everyone for allowing us to, to have some comments today on this. I know um, clean fill is a very sensitive subject to a lot of folks. And I think uh, the industry, I think the, f the folks here in the room, I think the people who have spoken today, everybody wants this to be done right. And, and I think now is the time to, to make these changes and to try to incorporate a policy with a department that's going to serve everyone very well. Thank you. Good morning. My name is John Tallarico, and I want to thank everybody for hosting the senators and the representatives for coming here today and allowing me the opportunity to speak to you. Um, my partners and I are known as Barnsdale Associates, LLC. Uh, we have engaged in efforts to redevelop a 150-acre former limestone quarry that we acquired from Bethlehem Steel in 1988. Quarrying operations at the property began in the 1920s. At the time of our purchase, Bethlehem Steel had essentially abandoned those operations at this facility. The former quarry is located at 1600 Freemansburg Avenue in Freemansburg, Pennsylvania. Um, I would first like to provide some additional background information regarding the location and the history of the property that we are redeveloping. The former limestone quarry which is an industrial site, was abandoned by Bethlehem Steel after the company's operations began winding down. For years, Bethlehem Steel blasted, excavated, crushed limestone, creating a noisy and dusty operation within a quiet, populous community. When we purchased the former quarry, it had 100-foot high walls around the perimeter after Bethlehem Steel had extracted approximately 20 million tons of material from the location. In addition to the gaping hole left after years of continuous mining, Bethlehem Steel left behind rusting mining equipment, no, protect, no protection around the perimeter, and no warning size for it to prevent any accidents from occurring. Children frequently played on the flat fields surrounding the quarry, and the quarry was an attractive nuisance to the surrounding community. Members of the community frequently rode motorcycles and four-wheelers through the space, uh, and someone could have been seriously injured from a fall from the high wall. After we purchased the property, we prioritized safety and immediately fenced in the facility with over a mile of, of fencing, as well as warning signs and gates. The property, the property is currently zoned for industrial use in an otherwise urban environment, and our reuse plan is to develop the property in a manner that will benefit the community uh, as well as the environment. Uh, our goal from the start was to fill and restore the property so that the property can be reused for beneficial use and generate tax revenue for the Freemansburg Borough. In order to restore the property, we have needed to obtain fill material to enable us to recontour the quarried area. We use the fill material for this purpose that is classified as clean fill, 
under technical guidance issued by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. At first, business was slow and it took several years to have enough material to fill in the lowest spots in the quarry just to be able to drive around the floor of the location. In an effort to achieve our ultimate goal of restoring the property, we have added the necessary equipment to manage activities at the property in compliance with Pennsylvania regulatory requirements. Working in an urban environment with trucks coming and going certainly has not been an easy task. We have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on street cleaning equipment, water trucks, engineering, as well as environmental reviews and approval to minimize the impacts of the project on the local community. We pride ourselves on compliance with all applicable environmental laws and regulations. We currently hold an NPDES permit for erosion and sedimentation control and have constructed two large retention basins to prevent any erosion from activities on our property. All the fill material that we receive at the property is screened by us first to make sure that the fill complies with PADEP clean fill standards. Our environmental engineers then submit the information about the fill material to PADEP for review and approval. All trucks are weighed upon arrival to ensure compliance. We feel that we also serve the local community by allowing customers like the City of Bethlehem and other contractors doing both private and public construction projects to reuse fill material generated from their projects. For years, contractors have struggled to find a suitable location to reuse excessive amount of construction soil, rock, concrete that qualify as clean fill. And we provide a valuable outlet for that material. We are extremely cautious to ensure that we do not accept any trucks containing any type of construction, demolition or waste. We have employees on location that inspect every load of fill material that enters our facility. In addition to this property in Freemansburg, I am also part owner with a different group of partners of an industrial uh, property formerly known, uh, formerly owned by Bethlehem Steel as well. This property is a 90 acre former Bethlehem Steel slag bank. This property is now known as Bethlehem Earth LP. Again, many problems initially existed at this property and a number of challenges remain to get this property up to grade to allow successful redevelopment. With a projected need to import approximately 7 million tons of fill material to establish a buildable grade for redevelopment. This property is authorized under general permit WMGR-096 issued by PEDP to accept fill material classified as regulated fill. In addition, clean fill can be used as fill material at this property. The property is also approved by EPA, meaning that this property can accept fill materials from uh, sites being remediated under the oversight of the EPA, as long as the materials meet the requirements of general permit 096. The restoration of this property has, been, has the full support of the city of Bethlehem. This project is expected to take 10 years to complete and will eventually support 600,000 square feet of new commercial and industrial space immediately adjacent to Lehigh Valley Industrial Park. Without the use of PADEP's regulated general fill permit 096, this property would simply could not be redeveloped for commercial or industrial purposes, resulting in the loss of significant economic development and tax revenues. Moreover, the environmental condition of the property would remain unaddressed and there would be increased pressure to develop projects on farmland, forested land, and other greenfield sites, which would be anti-ethical to the Commonwealth policies designed to maximize the reuse of formal industrial sites. Bethlehem Earth LP has partnered with Clean Earth Environmental Incorporated to run the facility. With Clean Earth bringing years of expertise to this operation, we also provide stream monitoring to track the health of the local tributary in connection with this property. In conclusion, I strongly feel that these type of approved restoration products provide significant benefits to local communities and the Commonwealth, address potential environmental hazards, and conserve greenfield sites. The ability to use clean fill and regulated to fill to facilitate redevelopment activities is critical to the economic viability of the Commonwealth and enables surplus soil of brick, rock, 
concrete materials to be beneficially used rather than winding up in landfills. Also, through our compliance with local, state, and regulations, we are ensuring that the properties that we are redeveloping remain available for use by future generations. We are also committed to providing additional local benefits. For example, at our Freemansburg facility, we have dedicated a passive recreation area of about 25 acres to a BMX bike club, uh, non-motorized, uh, for their activities. Through our efforts, we are committed to providing an environmentally sound and valuable surplus soil reuse option for the construction industry, while at the same time making a positive contribution to local economies in the communities where we operate through our redevelopment activities. I want to thank you all for your time and allowing me to speak. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. I'm going to start with you, Brian. Um, I was looking for your, um, your notes. Your, 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 you didn't, I didn't have, you, you had prepared remarks. Did, I didn't, I, did we didn't get them? Or did, were, there, were they in the back? On, they were in the back, okay. So I didn't have it. So I was looking through here. And so I figured maybe it's out of order. So I see the mayor of Whitehall who's going to be testifying next. And, and then I look about, and then I see a letter here from uh, the United States, uh, uh, from the, um, it, it, it's from the notice of noncompliance from the EPA. And, and I'm reading in paragraph number three, where it says the DEP notified EPA about a certain um, shipment that you received. It's paragraph three. Now, if, if you'd like to comment on it, because I'm concerned, because these are the type of things that put doubt in people's minds when they see this. Are you, are you just specifically, you're talking about paragraph three, page one, starting with the word specifically? Yeah. Okay. Take a, you know, if you could address that. Every, Okay. Um, be a little general in nature rather than sit here and read the whole thing again. Um, what happened at our facility, and uh, there's a few facilities uh, that have been notified by EPA of a similar issue um, with the PCBs, is that we accepted um, a project um, or submitted a project for approval, I should state, um, to DEP for a project that had uh, two areas where the PCB value exceeded a value of two. Um, EPA wrote this notice uh, of noncompliance based on the approval email from the DEP that approved the project um, and not any specific information as to what was actually accepted. Um, so there's a lot of uh, information in this that's not exactly correct. Um, we have since responded as requested by EPA with the specific information. Um, and to what actually happened was there was we accepted one area that had a, an exceedance of, of the limit of two, but in the EPA, this is a multi-level regulatory issue. Um, in EPA's regulation, it is stated that a PCB less than 50 parts per million is not contaminated according to the regulations. That was what, as an in industry-wide understanding of the EPA requirements, um, the use regulations actually don't specifically state at two parts per million as you read it. There's a, a level of interpretation that has to happen with these regulations, which are, are uh, many, many pages long of, of, of legal terms. Uh, since we are notified by the EPA of this issue, we addressed uh, and explained and provided all the documents related to what we uh, did take, what testing was conducted, um, and currently, we're awaiting EPA's response on that matter. Um, the material in question has been isolated. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, specifically marked on site and, uh, and surveyed so that we know where we would go if this material has to be uh, resumed. There is, however, a lengthy amount of interpretational issues with the, the EPA PCB regulations that cause for um, exemptions and uh, a whole level of stuff. So. We are still waiting EPA's final determination so we can get a better understanding of exactly their terminology. The confusing part of all this is that we at no point did we exceed our regulated fill permit. And it's been discussed here about the EP standard limits versus the PCBs. Um, 
And, and yes, that is, a, that is a concern for us because we assume in some sense if you're following the permits you've been issued that you're following also the greater uh, understanding of the limits that would be applied to you in the situation. So uh, for this fact, we're waiting for EPA's determination. In the meantime, we're, we're complying and using the two as a value till we get a, a, a written determination from the EPA. Um, so it's still on your site? Yes. And, you, and what would happen if the EPA says it's got to go? If the EPA says it has to go, it will be immediately uh, tested. It would be uh, approved at a disposal facility. We would remove it, take it to that site, and then we would conduct endpoint end sampling to prove that all the material in question has been removed. And, and you know, I, if something is coming from somewhere else, do you get a breakdown of the materials? I think I, think I heard you, that you do. If, like, this came from New York. Did New York send you something saying, this is what, what's in this fill? Uh, you, you can expect this, uh, where it came from, and this is what it is. And do you get something from them? Or, we, or no? Or you just, it just shows up, and here we are, and we're going to have No, I, absolutely not. Uh, OK. When you say New York, it Because that, this site, it, this came from New York. That's what I'm reading here. The, the shipment originated in New yeah. York. It very well may have. Um, I'd have to refer back to it. The, the thing with the management of fill policy, clean or regulated, it's about what the material, what requirements the material meets, not necessarily where the material comes from. It could come from Allentown, it could come from, from uh, Bangor. It, it, as long as it's meeting that analytical criteria based on the management fill policy or regulated fill permits with the testing requirements and the site histories. Um, so in the review, we get the testing is done prior. We pre-approve everything. So one of the, I hear the constant question about is the material tested? Absolutely, the material is tested. Um, it is tested according to the standard based on the number of samples per the volume of material, um, so that we can review all that information prior to accepting it. Um, DPs uh, informed of all the issues, and we work out or get approved for the project uh, from them. In a, an example of a larger project, be it New York, New Jersey, even Pennsylvania, you have multiple levels of environmental review that happens on a large project. So large commercial project will probably have their own specific environmental uh, engineering firm. They will do what's uh, called a phase one or phase two testing, which, uh, which will review the site histories. It'll review uh, any kind of past use. It'll review the testing conducted on the site. That information is reviewed by my staff to make sure that um, what we're looking at could potentially qualify as clean or regulated. Mm -hmm. My company also disposes of material at multiple other facilities, gamut from you know, hazardous waste to clean fill at properly permitted facilities. Um, once that information is reviewed, you might need additional testing. You might need to make sure that you have the proper amount of testing so that, is, that further activity would happen which is also reviewed by their third party environmental consultant who has his uh, license, um, often by a state agency as well. Um, and once we gather all the information that we would need, we would submit to the department for approval. In certain states and in certain programs, there is actually a physical notice that might come from that state agency, but that's not necessarily a uh, uh, in all cases, in all uh, agencies. But some agencies do have a thing where they will send us a, a letter as the receiving facility on record um, prior to accepting material that you have all the proper information. Usually has some kind of electronic uh, uh, repository database. We review to make sure, yes, we were provided all the information. We know what, what in case we're talking about and there might be some back and forth. Just, uh, you know, as if as a former mayor, and I had an EPA site that uh, that had uh, a Superfund site that had to be cleaned up, that I made sure was cleaned up. It wasn't in my borough, but just outside my borough. If I get a letter like this as a mayor, and this stuff is coming in, you know, it shakes you up. I know the mayor is going to be here next, and I I I, I heard John, if you don't mind me calling you John, his comment that he has a great working relationship with the municipality. Um, you know. Do you have the same relationship with East, Strouds, East, Borough, East Bangor, excuse me, and with Whitehall? Uh, each township is going to be its own. We attempt to try to have the most open and, and direct uh, discussions that we can have. Um, there are sometimes multiple reasons why that might or might not happen. Um, 
I'm very disappointed in this letter specifically because EPA wrote a violation based on an approval, not based on information they actually had. They, in fact, from what we can interpret, had no documentation on the project itself that they are violating us on. So you basically, there's a lot of incorrect information in here based wow. on what really, what happened in the case because though the project as a total was approved, not all of it was accepted. Um, so it does bother me greatly that this kind of information is put out uh, as, as statement of fact without um, being verified by the uh, agency in question. It also came to our attention that it wasn't provided to uh, the township um, you know, in a reasonable time frame, which is, is typical. Um, so that caused some additional concerns because the information wasn't provided in a timely fashion. Okay. Let me follow up Thank with, you. Uh, from Mario's question. Yeah. Uh, you'd referenced the, the need to, to fill the pits, especially those closest to communities. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did some extraordinarily stupid things as a teenager, and I've got a scar right here to prove it, and one was playing in, in abandoned pits where I had no legal right to, to be. And I, I understand there's a big difference between filling a pit with rock and brick and arsenic and PCBs, all right? Obviously, you're going to have a very different uh, set of circumstances. We've heard again and again that you know, there have been problems in the past. In, in your businesses, how do you rebuild trust in a community which has suffered in the past? It's all about compliance. Uh, if we have a question, we'll go to the PADEP about a particular project that, that's presented to us. And uh, a good portion of the times they tell us no, don't take this job, and we won't. Uh, when it came to the PCB issue, um, that was, we couldn't get it. We wanted a straight answer, but couldn't. But um, to their credit, they, the PADP told us to contact the EPA, and we did. And we didn't get an answer. So we, we follow the, you know, the guidelines as best we can. And, and we e tried to email, tried to get phone calls, um, we didn't get an answer. Uh, so we try to follow every, every rule as possible and, and to always make it better. And we do get a lot of brick and rock and, and construction type material, and more so than anything with, obviously, with levels of arsenic that we can accept. So that is a big portion of what we take in. Thank you. Do you mind if I? Sure, please. Um, the other thing is there's, there's the established requirements that are out there uh, with the management fill policy and regulated fill, but there is a lot of stuff that um, I can speak for my company and I know some others that do as well, um, internal actions that we do to try to ensure our own compliance that aren't required. Um, one of them in our case is both of our uh, operations have groundwater monitoring. It's not required. It's not required as per permit. Um, we have looked at the history of the concerns that have come up. We've decided it's in our best interest, to, you know, to collect that data. Um, some of the initial concerns of um, our properties from the neighbors is the impact of the groundwater, which is a completely understandable concern. But um, we wanted to do a study to see, okay, if one, are we having any impact, which according to our, our, our data at this point is no. Um, and it, it should continue that way as not to have an impact. But then even if you did have an impact, we would have data within our site to, to manage and control whatever potential might happen. And again, there is a lot of, there's, there, there is potential um, for issues to happen here. Absolutely, I won't deny that. Um, however, we do everything we can be, and even beyond the policies at hand to mitigate those concerns because you know, in our cases as, as business owners and, 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 and industry, we own the property. So if it is contaminated, we are ultimately the responsible party. We, there was discussion about contamination on our property. Um, uh, historically, somebody else had brought in material. It was unacceptable. And during the transaction of purchasing the property, we then owned it. Um, so we were left holding the bag of somebody else's uh, actions, which could be proven. 
Um, we were looking for uh, the guidance to get it removed. We did remove it. Um, but again, during that process, it, it, it affects us. I, I, if there is a, an issue, DEP is going to come after us to fix it and clean it up. Um, so it's unlike some of the other issues that you might have heard out, uh, about where a third party person comes in, dumps his material on that site, and then just up and disappears. Um, and those concerns are valid if, if the people don't ensure what they're, the process that they're doing is proper. Um, there is a lot, of, a lot of material that's moved on a daily basis that's maybe not following the specific policy uh, as for paperwork or, or whatever it might be. But again, that's why our companies ensure that those actions are happening. So there is some stuff that happens that's not reported um, that we do internally. Okay, thank you. All right. Representative Brown. I know we're running tight on time, so I'll try to be quick. Thank you all for your testimony. And I'm um, definitely understanding the importance of redevelopment and the need for Phil. Uh, I appreciate your testimonies, especially that way. And, um, you know, I kind of look at this as follow the Phil almost, you know, in when you say it comes from a certain site and then sometimes it has paperwork depending on the state or where it's coming from. And then when it gets to you, there could be documents or not documents. Um, I think on some of that and um, what documents uh, that, that you just mentioned um, sometimes are there and sometimes aren't, but you do some internal um, regulation that's, that helps with that. I think we probably should get more information on that. I think with the documentation that maybe should be not just with your company, but should be with every company or every fill that, that is moving. Um, Mr. Tallarico, you had mentioned uh, during your testimony, which was fantastic. Can you, did I hear you say that you do test every load before you utilize it? We, we take a, a project package, and Brian does a lot of this as well. Uh, we all do. And so it's, it's a lot about uh, the location, the site history, a phase one, a phase two of that particular project, no matter where it comes from, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York. So we get a complete package, and then all the test data comes with that. So um, it's out of my pay grade to, to analyze all that data. So we pay an environmental engineer to review it for us. Okay. And then we, we gather everything that we need to submit to the PADEP for their blessing or re rejection. So okay. there, is, there is an awful lot of data that goes with every, every soil project that comes in, whether it's um, yes. Uh, what was there at, at that site prior to, you know, to this being demolished. So, um, and Brian, I'm sure, can add to it because he, he worked in the industry uh, and that end of it lo longer than I have. So, uh, I think you covered it very well. Um, when you say have or not have, when it comes to our companies and our, you know, level of operations, everything has paperwork. The packages can be inches thick of what's submitted to the department after we reviewed tens of thousands of pages of documents um, to ensure that the information is proper. And then from there, once we get an approval with the contractor or the site, then there's actual physical manifests that are signed by uh, the generator on the site, that it, it is material from his site. It's signed by the truck driver who picks it up, which is usually the same driver who's gonna drop it off. Um, and then it's signed by the receiving facility. So, you know, the case that the, the material that was loaded and arrived at your facility, we're able to track from, you know, industry term, cradle to grave, so that we have those tracking records. So it's the question of what happens to it in the meantime and um, is answered because somebody on the job site loaded it, the trucker certifies that that was the material he picked up and dropped off and then the facility signs it. And both the generator and us as a receiving facilities use those records um, when we log it into our computer system. If anyone asks what loads, what tonnage, everything is tracked by paper. So again, now smaller operations or fly by night. That's that's what I'm thinking. You know, so so it could there could be the opportunity for things to not be as well run. That's really yes, the well, I, I, okay. I'm going to jump in here. I don't think that's a necessarily a facility specific item. I think you're kind of more asking on a policy in general question. Um, 
one of the things that's currently in the management of fill policy uh, does not require testing on all projects. Um, you could take material from your backyard and agree with another neighbor to put it on their backyard and there, there's no testing required for that. There's no indication. Um, the, the parties between each, each other have done their own due diligence. You're coming from a residential property, you're going to a residential property. That is what the policy kind of allows for now at this point. When you start managing large amounts of material, three, four, five, hundreds of thousands of materials, testing usually is always required by the receiving facility. Brian's facilities, John's facilities, facilities that I've worked with in New Jersey and other places in Pennsylvania, they always require testing to make sure that they can actually comply with clean fill. Um, so some of the paperwork that you would get um, would be, I have a residential property, here's a residential property, it could be that simple. Some of it could be very complex. I did a, a phase one environmental assessment and I've looked at all the past uses of this property back to before it was developed. When you establish that history of the site, you then make determinations. Do I have a potential of there being a release or something that may not qualify as clean fill? You look at that, then you, maybe you do a phase two where you do some soil testing on that site and you can say, okay, maybe this portion where they had tanks is bad, but this portion is good. That's where the environmental professionals come in and the people evaluating these packages start to make the determination on what is and what isn't clean fill or could be acceptable to specific facilities. Okay. Representative Mako, a final question before we move to the next panel. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a real quick question for the panel uh, for my edification. When you have a restricted fill that's so like we have going on right now at Copley Aggregate with that load that the EPA is waiting to rule on, what do you do with that fill once it's deemed unacceptable? Do you return, return to sender or do you, do we push it off to West Virginia? What, 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 um, what, what do we do with the... The, uh, all right, so what, what would normally happen if it was an issue where it was something identified by us as we inspect the load of being unloaded, um, that would be something we would, the truck is still here, we would reload it, send it back to sender type situation. Um, if it's something that would happen after the fact, um, there's a multitude of options, uh, some of which would be weighed by what, what occurred. Um, it could be a situation where we're going to go back to the generator and say, you have responsibility for this because of uh, misrepresentation or, or, or some responsibility that they would have. Then we would contract with them to bring the trucks. We would load it, send it back. If we did that, we would, want, we would again, manifest it, track it to at least their facility so that we know that we've done what we are responsible for. Um, or what often would happen is you are going to determine what it is and find a proper and permitted disposal facility at our cost, and we would have to move it out. Um, in the case of uh, the, the PCB would be uh, probably the third option where we would look for a permanent disposal facility and take it, take it there. Representative Hunt. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Brian, you had mentioned in your testimony that you have internal policies. So as you heard, some of the concerns they have is the traffic, the trucking coming in 2.30 in the morning and dumping. Like, so what are your, can you share with us what your internal policies are, how you penalize these companies who are not in compliance, maybe uh, coming in early, coming in late, and do you allow dumping at 2.30 in the morning? Is that something that you have crews working 24-7? How do you handle those things that we've heard from the previous panel? Um. Okay, that's a little broad. Uh, let me try with the, the 2 a.m. situation. Um, our facilities being uh, non-residential don't have any specific uh, time frame, so we could operate in a 24-7 capacity. Uh, we try not to because of the obvious uh, potential uh, impact to the residents. Um, however, there are some projects like road projects where they are trying to do the work at night to lessen the impact to the citizens as they go drive to work during business hours. Um, in those cases, if there's no other option, we would entertain. Um, and then usually we would look at maintaining a, a specific requirements on how they would come in, how many trucks, stuff like that, so that we're not, uh, again, being making an overly uh, large impact. The example that was given is not my facility, by the way. Um, the other internal policies are that we are, are, are too broad to, to be very specific here, but we do have a, a policies, i.e. the overweight truck policy. When 
I don't hire the truck. I don't even know the truck until it necessarily gets to my facility. Once it's at my facility, I can't reject them because there's a legal issue of knowingly put that truck back on the road as an overweight. So um, that's not an option as we've been informed by our uh, legal uh, counsel. Um, so we are going to accept it because why, why make the problem twice as bad uh, in that situation? What we do, however, is we have a penalty system that we deal with the drivers that, that impacts their day and impacts their, their costs uh, and their time um, to where they're very unhappy um, with that action. So we do that to try to be more compliant. I have a difficulty complying, uh, managing compliance outside of my facility. I do try communication. Um, I think we do uh, communicate, uh, especially with East Banger, in the sense of if we're told that certain trucks are, are driving too fast, if you can give me a, a name, a color, a number, I can, I can specifically deal with that truck. We have separate penalties that we'll deal in those cases. Um, again, I, I can't see what they're doing out on, on the highway. Um, so we do try to enforce those things and we do try to manage our operations, um, as I'm sure John does as well, that whatever we can do to try to lessen the impact, i.e. build a sound barrier wall between our operations and the, the property boundary or, or something like that, we always try to take that into account. Um, more specifically, I, I mean, there's many examples. I'll just be here all day. Brian, a follow-up question. Would you consider East Bangor residential? East Bangor, the town, absolutely is residential. Right. Our property but, that we own is but not. But don't, aren't they driving through the residential to get to your property? They're driving through a state road, Route 512 and 611 to get to our, turn to, and they turn immediately onto our property. Correct, but that state road has a tremendous amount of homes on it. People I understand there. that, but there's a it's lot of truck traffic on that road in general um, beyond what impact I might have and, and average my trucks are not the majority of the trucks that are traveling on that road every day. At two in the morning? At three I'm in the morning? I'm not open at two in the morning. Well, you just, you just I, I can be, but very rarely. I think we might have done it once in two years. And it was a state, it was a Pennsylvania project of which we stayed open for, a Pennsylvania PennDOT project. Okay. The House and Senate, when I was first elected, had a tradition of frequently working through the night and no one ever remembers the good things that we did. Uh, I think someone's mother told us that nothing good happens after, you know, one o'clock in the morning. And so uh, uh, you can understand the, the concerns of oh, the community. Absolutely. Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We hear now from a panel, Upper Mount Bethel Township, Whitehall Township, and uh, Bangor Borough. Dave, I'm impressed.
All right, let's begin. Okay. Good afternoon. It was, was supposed to be good morning. Um, good afternoon, senators, representatives, distinguished guests, and staff. Um, my name is David Dew. I'm here with John Birmingham. Uh, we are elected supervisors of Upper Mount Bethel Township, Northampton County, Pennsylvania. I stand here before you today not only as an elected public official, but a lifelong resident of the Slate Belt. So that's 60-ish years. We won't go any further. Um, the Slate Belt, it's 10 municipalities, six boroughs, four townships, 116 square miles, 36,000 residents. A lot of folks don't know that. Um, the map I have here is of the Slate Belt. The brightly colored areas are the zoning areas of those municipalities along the 512 corridor. Okay. Um, I'm a remodeler, builder, contractor, and I understand that getting rid of Construction debris is an issue, so I can sympathize with other contractors. I'm also a trout farmer and an aquaculturist. Many jobs, I don't sleep. Um, with that, you know, my wife and I like saying, it's not about the fish in the water, it's about the water that the fish are in, which is a serious issue. And you heard that from Mr. Bartosh earlier. And I'm a very strong advocate of clean water, okay? Um, I, we all can live without oil. We can't live without water. Water is the next oil. I'm sure all of you have heard that. A week ago, I was in Alaska, and I've seen firsthand the glaciers melting, okay? It's, it's unbelievable. So everybody needs to do that trip. I don't know if you guys could write that off or not. So, um, Upper Mount Bethel Township, I'll jump back there from where I'm at. Um, the township has 24 of 44 recognized significant natural areas. isn't going to move. The big green area is Upper Mount Bethel Township. It's 44 square miles. The green area is 20 square miles of that. And again, those are recognized, recognized areas from the state. The majority of those areas are all wetlands, lakes, streams, woodlands, which are very important to our environment. We have 3,000 acres of passive recreation land within our township, a wild and scenic river on our eastern border, and the Appalachian Trail on our northern border, which is within the location of the Delaware National Recreation Area. Also on the Monroe County side is the Cherry Valley Wildlife Refuge, National Wildlife Refuge, which is actually encroaching into Upper Mount Bethel at this time. So eventually I, I see the federal government being here more. Um, the Slate Belt is rich in natural diversity and wildlife but our greatest asset is our water quality. Why else would a major bottled water company remove millions of gallons of water for their customers? 
and I won't mention any names, but I think the uh, Senator Scavella mentioned that earlier this morning. Why we have a not a why we have a great natural gift in our water resources. It is a frag it is fragile, and due to our slate mining history, easy access the slate belt quarries, as seen on the map. allow for open and direct access to our aquifer. Need to flip on that. This being the 512 corridor right here, all these little yellow dots with the, the orange around them, they're all quarries. The water level in the quarries does not fall with the seasons. It stays at the same level, and I've watched this all my, again, 60-ish years. The depth, the depth, the depth of the greater are greater than most individual wells. However, to a company searching for a place to dump their waste products, such as regulated dirt, which we call dirty dirt in the township, our slate quarries are big holes in the ground, and they're perfect for dumping. There was a, there was a long history of our quarries being used as dumps. And I, I would like to touch on a, a couple of these issues real quick. And I don't want to bore you, so. Starting in Upper Mount Bethel Township, just across the Portland Bridge, Upper Mount Bethel Township is in litigation. We are being sued because a developer wants to come in, he needs to build a retention pond for fire water, okay, for su fire suppression. And our engineer calculated that he needs 5,000 truckloads. He has permission to use clean fill, but they came back to us and they wanted to use regulated dirt, which we are totally opposed against, so they slapped a lawsuit against us. Um, our Eastern Industries property. Used to be an old strip mine for sand and gravel. The supervisors last year preserved 216 acres of the approximate 300 acres. So we're making it a, a preserve. Constantly, our manager tells us that there are people calling to abate the property by bringing dirt in. And you know our, what our response is. It's a definite no. But um, again, there's, there's on the preserved part, which is in the orange, there's 12 bodies of water. Um, a lot of the fish from Lake Mincy, if you're aware of the Lake Minc Mincy project, went into two of those bodies of water. So the water is pristine. The water bubbles up through the sand. So um, it's a nice place. You need to visit it. Um, East Bangor. We'll go to East, back to East Bangor. East Bangor has VIP, but they also have, and the representative from East Bangor mentioned, American Farm Harvesters. That took place in the 80s. It was only supposed to be construction material. Well, it's an EPA super fun site for a reason. I was told by an official from East Bangor it would have cost one billion, with a B, to abate that property. 
So the federal government decided just to cover it over. Um, again, it was, a, it was a wet hole. There was water in it. My brother lives just above that property. His wife passed away from cancer. His daughter has cancer. And if you go in a straight line right up North Broad Street over Fox Gap Road, there was 11 cases of cancer over the past, well, it went from, it was a 10 year period. Um, four of those people passed away. And there were six in one family. And again, it, that issue still needs to be looked into and I've been screaming for four years about that. Um, Bangor Borough, right across the street from Capitol Quarry, one hole is getting, it's still a wet hole, it's getting water from the waste treatment plant. It's blue. Um, if you're looking for microinvertebrates, they, they will not be in there, I can guarantee you. Um, the next three holes on the same side of the road were filled with fly ash over the past 50 years. Two of those holes were never lined. And I had a report two or three years ago that they were finding fly ash in Nazareth. Well, the only place fly ash could be coming from is one of these holes. Um, again, the fly ash came from the local power plant. The, um, I'm gonna say 42, three years ago, there was a sign out on the fence at the power plant. Danger, carcinogen. So they put it in the water table. So again, a little disturbing. Uh, Mr. Bartosh touched on the horseshoe quarry where again, the, the slag from the old quarry was put in the hole and again, affected their water at the hatchery. Um, we have we have waste management. Personally, I feel because I frequent the place, it's a, it's a good operation. I have to say that. Um, then we have a quarry hole in Wind Gap, um, just a mile from here, if that. The hole was 450 feet deep. It was filled with tires. So 450 feet is the equation of 45 stories. So go to New York City and look at a 45 story building filled with tires. It was covered over, I believe last year or the year before because it was not going to be abated. And I believe Senator Scavella at your, the meeting we had in your office in 2015, that was brought up that it was going to get covered over. So, and that was by DEP. Um, in 2014, personally, we had 2,000 catfish die, okay? The trout were fine, catfish died. The pond that they were in had a separate spring out of an aquifer. Um, the question is, how do you kill catfish? You bury them in the mud and you can dig them up a year from now and they'll throw some water on them, they'll still be flopping around. That was puzzling. But as that was going on, I was getting reports of people's wells were changing. It was a three mile stretch from right above my home all the way to Lake Mincy. They were going from clear, pristine, this is the side of a mountain, pristine to brown to, gr brown to black. So. Again, questions were asked, never got a response. Um, in 2015, beginning of 2015, Risotto, Risotto Borough has a quarry hole. Um, it's a quarter mile from my house, started giving off sulfur dioxide smells. People from Washington Township were actually calling me and you know, they were asking me what was going on and I said, well, don't know. So I called Washington Township and we, we kind of discussed it. And there was another hole in um, Washington Township, which is on Bank, American Bangor Road, 
um, which was also having the same toxic, disgusting odor, which you know was a sulfur type smell. And what we, what I got from Washington Township, they said it was purging, but it, it's still lasting to this day. Again, it's winter time, where where you get the the most toxic smells. Um, And then we, we have, the, we have the, the issue of, and Senator Scavell, I know you don't want to hear this, but it's sludge, sludge, sludge. So what is the long-term science, I'm just going to throw this out quick, long-term science of the product? Yeah, and again, I know that's up for another conversation, but it's being And we're spread, going to have that conversation, David. It's being we are. spread through the slate belt. So, um, and it's on the B, class B sludge. And again, everything that I just discussed penetrates the ground, into the groundwater. From a class I just took over the past spring and winter, 25% um, of water penetrates to the aquifer. Okay, that, that's a good thing, but if we get constant rain, that becomes, becomes an issue because the percentages go up with which, what is going into the aquifer. But um, at this point, I'm going to turn the rest of the statement over to John Birmingham. Thank, thank you, you for listening. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for inviting Supervisor Dew and I here today. And this is a joint prepared statement, so uh, Supervisor Dew has hit most of the main points. and. Uh, and I will say, Senator, thank you for that upcoming meeting on sludge. Uh, we do look forward to that. And I know we're talking about fill today. But I also, also hope we talk about uh, Class B and Class A sludge, because I think they're both uh, dangerous. Just uh, finishing up on, uh, on our joint statement, I just want to say to everyone here today, Senators and Representatives, we need laws for regulated fill that are identical and consistent with our neighboring states. We need to know why New York and New Jersey have stricter standards than Pennsylvania. We really, that's really a, a big concern, uh, not only for me, but I would say for a lot of people here in attendance today. When the Hudson River is being dredged and the material is not considered clean fill, in New Jersey and New York, the contractors load their trucks and they send them here. And like that has been discussed most recently at the Capitol Quarry in East Bangor. Hundreds of heavy trucks roll into the facility on a daily basis. And if you have some spare time, come just sit on 512 in, a, in our wonderful township and you'll see trucks coming all day long. And uh, I remember when I campaigned for my position in 2015, I stood out in front of the Mount Bethel Firehouse doing what politicians do, and I was amazed at how many trucks I saw come down 611. Uh, it's a safety concern as well, because those trucks are not going the uh, 35 miles per hour that is mandated by the state. Uh, they're going a lot faster. Not only do these trucks that come down the road uh, speed, they also damage our roads. They make two runs a day, and the material they dump into our aquifer is defined as hazardous, hazardous waste in our neighboring states. I think we need to really look at whether we should be classifying this as hazardous waste as well. Less than a mile from the Capitol quarry sits another quarry that was filled with construction debris and is now a Superfund site. What happens when the quarries we allow to be filled today contaminate our wells tomorrow and they become the next Superfund sites? Will the taxpayer be foot footing the bill when a simpler solution is to change the law now and reclassify dredge material 
and contaminated fill for what they truly are, hazardous waste. Our laws concerning clean and regulated fill must be consistent with our neighboring states. The solution isn't only about protecting the environment, it's about protecting the health of our citizens, protecting our individual wells, our public wells, protecting the clean water that we need to survive. To allow anything less than full protection of our water resources is to squander our true wealth, and it's to squander the health of our families, our friends, and our neighbors. Thank you very much. I would like to finish This is a creed, Native American prophecy. It says, only after the last tree has been cut down, only after the last river has been poisoned, only after the last fish has been caught, only then will you find that money can't be eaten. I'd like to finish with that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Caracol. I'm the mayor in Whitehall Township, and uh, I would like to thank the committee for inviting me here today. I'd also like to thank Zach Mako and Jean McNeil for being here today. They represent our community, and I know they're a bit far afield, but we appreciate their being here to support us. Um, I'm going to diverge, uh, if you're following along here, from what I had published previously in the interest of time. I'm hoping we'll be able to have a lively conversation. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the experiences that we had with Copley aggregates uh, in our community. Um, in the late 1980s, Copley Cement auctioned off all of its properties uh, within our boundaries. Um, the uh, Copley aggregates property was bought uh, at that time, and it had uh, two large quarries on the property that they bought. Uh, one of the holes remains subject to an active mining permit. The other quarry hole is a subject of various DEP permits issued over the years for various uses, qualified over time by DEP to be beneficial or acceptable for the reclamation of the quarry. Although the hole was to be filled with clean fill pursuant to the state's definitions, various iterations of that definition allowed not only dirt but construction and demolition waste, mulch, glass, and ceramic waste materials. Repeatedly over the years, clean fill with its relaxed standards was contaminated with unclean fill. Unfortunately, lax DEP oversight and poor communication from the department created an environment in which we received notice of violations in the newspaper or through our own investigation. We've had pitifully poor communication from DEP, and we're concerned about that. In 2006, the township became aware of a mercury contamination problem at the site, and as a result, attempted a more aggressive monitoring of the facility. We were told by DEP in response that we were preempted from taking any action pertaining to the mercury incident. In 2014, Copley notified the township that they were going to request permission to fill the quarry with not just clean, but regulated fill. Prior to this time, Copley had always maintained that they would accept only clean fill at the site, even testifying to this effect before the Zoning Hearing Board. Based on Copley's past record of noncompliance to the clean fill regulations, the township chose to challenge this regulated permit by filing an appeal to the permit issued uh, issuance before the Pennsylvania Environmental Hearing Board. During this appeal process, the quarry owner was tagged by DEP for violations of permits when waste, including medical waste, was found at the site. That appeal process, which started in 2014, ended this June. The uh, township did not prevail, and during this time, regulated fill, untested and unmonitored in a matter of any sufficiency, continued to be placed at the site. Numerous truck weight violations continued, uh, including violations up to 14,527 pounds. Um, that's a whole other matter. We're here to talk about the fill 
and I will do my best to stay to that. Um, in mid-June, Copley staff, Copley aggregate staff met with myself and Whitehall staff. Um, there was an attempt to clear the air about the problems we'd experienced in the past. Um, we were told that they wanted to open new lines of communication. They wanted to win the respect uh, that they deserve. Um, unfortunately, after that meeting uh, and after we all shook hands, I received an email from the DEP notifying us that the EPA had determined that Phil tested in March of that year, 84 days prior to the day that we met with them in an open uh, forum at our, our township building. Um, we received notification finally that the EPA had determined that the fill which was in place now um, had exceeded their standards of two parts per million uh, and in fact it was contaminated at 6.75 parts per million. Um, there's a history here uh, that has unfortunately led to our not really believing what we hear from the owner. Um, the, the fact that the uh, DEP sent it to us when they did finally and only during the middle of a meeting that we had with them makes me curious as to why it happened at that time. I found that interesting. Um, after enforcement for DEP um, enforcement for DEP indicating that there was a major contamination of the PCBs at the site uh, that violated EPA standards. Subsequent contact by the township to DEP requesting information as to how the department was going to react to this contamination resulted in a statement issued by the governor's office of general counsel that the PCB levels, while a vi violation of U.S. EPA standards, were not a violation of DEPs. We understand that Pennsylvania is the only state in the union that th does not adhere to the U.S. EPA regulations, and I'm confused as to why that's the case. Um, when we have the EPA saying you should be concerned that there is a deadly carcinogen in place in your community, uh, sets off bells and whistles in the minds of the public. And then we're told by the uh, DEP that it's not a problem. It doesn't violate the health and safety of our community and I, along with most of the people in our community, are confused by that dichotomy. The lax definitions of fill in Pennsylvania as compared to our neighboring states has made it big business to bring in materials which are considered contaminated and unacceptable for use as fill or uh, for construction in other states but are acceptable here. A region has many large quarry halls making it a prime candidate for continued contamination. Uh, to cut to the chase, Copley Aggregate's ability to maintain a safe facility free of carcinogens, uh, carcinogens is something we've, lock, uh, we've lost confidence in. We've also lost, lost confidence in DEP's ability to control the problem and the fill that's being placed here. Um, the uh, testing protocols prior to, to the fill is uh, placed also have uh, lost confidence for us because we're told that they're placed inside, in situ, at the location from which they're to be transported. But unlike what I heard today, I was told during our meeting with Copley Aggregates that they don't do specific uh, testing on site. And I just don't know who to believe at this point. Um, our citizens are scared that their health and safety has been compromised. Uh, and our solicitor has been told by DEP staff not to call them anymore because we were engaged in action against the DEP and I don't understand why the DEP would feel it unnecessary to maintain dialogue with us with unrelated matters. Um, concerns me also. I provided a number of uh, exhibits that uh, I know you have gone through here. Um, we would be glad to answer any questions about any of the actions we've taken against DEP. We hope 
that we will find a way to guarantee that what leaves the site, even if it is being tested on site, we have no guarantee that that's actually what's going to arrive at the location of the fill, and we're concerned about that. Um, the arrogance of Copley Aggregates has been, uh, cre it's created an aura of fear, distrust, and concern that DEP has failed in the mission to control the location of dangerous chemicals in our community. Uh, our legacy to our children uh, is the contamination of ground and water. Pennsylvania has become the dumping ground of other states due to our lax definitions and enforcement. And with the new definition of reclamation fill, which we are told is coming, uh, we are only enhancing the problem. Lack of enforcement for uses that are permitted by the state combined with low standards and liberal definitions has resulted in frustration on the part of our residents and elected officials. And that's it for now. Thank you for paying attention. Good day. Thank you for listening to our fears and concerns. I'm Barry Schweitzer from the Bangor Borough Council. And on uh, Tuesday, August 24th, 2010, eight years ago, I was alerted to about 20 triaxles that were parked on the Ridge Road, waiting at the gate to the Bangor Borough incinerator to be opened. And it was the first round of about 100 truckloads that were dumped there by a man by the name of Art Fletcher, who was later convicted and sent to jail for con dumping contaminated soil. About the same time, Scott Kaler, another dirt entrepreneur, dumped about 100 truckloads on the east side of Route 191, <clears throat> about a mile down from the top of the mountain, right next to the Pennsylvania American Water Company property. This was later deemed to be contaminated, and some of it was hauled away. What happened was they were trying to make a plateau. They dumped a bunch of techo blocks there. It went down there. They couldn't get it all. They dug a bunch and hauled it away. In the next phase, slightly contaminated clean fill, according to PADEP, could be brought in and dumped just about anywhere. Due to the difference in regulations between NYDEP and JDEP and PADEP, in New York and New Jersey, this dirt would have to go to a lined landfill at a cost of about $100 a ton or $2,300 a truckload. Now, to bring a truck 80 miles from, the, let's say, the George Washington Bridge over into East Bangor cost about $500. They get about five miles to a gallon of diesel fuel. Anyhow, they're going back empty. Okay, so if you follow the money, and there's some sort of a tipping fee, I would guess it's about $500 a truckload, there's some big, big profits here, especially when you consider there's 180 to 200 truckloads a day. And when the police come along and they set up a way station, okay, they get about three or four trucks. Every one of them is greater than their 23 ton limit. The trucks stop. Cell phones, CB radios, I don't know. Anyhow, the point is they have a vested interest in cheating. The trucks get paid by the tons. The people that are loading those trucks, if they put in dirtier dirt, okay, they slip it in so nobody sees it, hey, that's more money in their profit and more money in their pocket because they get paid accordingly. Uh, and if you bring enough contaminated soil into the area and you dump it into the water-filled quarries, the aquifer, visible, the local environment will be changed forever. Think Flint, Michigan. Now, when you burn a, a gallon of diesel fuel, according to the U.S. Energy Administration, you produce 22.3 pounds of CO2, okay? That means every truck comes in and goes home, produce 716 pounds of CO2, okay? It's one pollution point that I don't think anybody really sees, okay? Uh, 
Multiply that times 200 trucks a day, you get 72 tons of CO2 every day. That's just that one quarry. Now, I served our country in Vietnam 1967-68, and I saw firsthand the use of Agent Orange. They told us it was safe. Well, history has told us something different. I am just afraid the same thing can be happening here, but when we find out, it'll be too late. One last note, we didn't inherit this land from our forefathers to do with what we want. We're borrowing it from our grandchildren. Thank you. I want to thank all four of you. You know, you bring up issues that uh, we, needs to be addressed. And um, I, at the least, Mayor, at the least, we should be at the EPA standards. I, I do agree with you. At the least. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do, but it, it, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave it up to DEP to, uh, you know, who, who's listening, and uh, hopefully we won't have to lit litigate, and, uh, but I mean, not lit legislate, excuse me. Um, you know, Dave, you did a great presentation. The American farm harvesters, you never mentioned that to me at all. About, I didn't know about this at all. And, uh, and I, you know, I'd, I'd like to go and take a look and, and really try to address it. Uh, you know, just having something covered uh, out there shouldn't be. Uh, so, if possible, let's, let's, let's talk about that. Sure. Um, the other issue, um, with the, uh, and, I, and I've said it, I said it earlier, with the sludge. Um, we don't, we didn't have, um, DEP did not have a, in front of them um, the plan for, for the, the submittal. Without the submittal, we can't have a hearing. Once they go over that submittal, then we can have a hearing here and we will. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Representative Mako. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Mayor Herricle, thank you for coming out. I appreciate it today. I know that you, Representative McNeil, and myself talked personally about um, the communication breakdown that happens between DEP and the local municipalities. Um, I was going to ask you to elaborate on that, and you beat me to it, so I appreciate that. Um, and uh, you know, I, and you've been dealing with this for years, and I'm just learning about this in the last month, and I was surprised that the DEP doesn't have a, a policy. I guess they, you have an internal policy. You told me 10 days to let or notify a local municipality if there is a uh, business or operation that is in violation within um, their jurisdiction. And I have a bill to, to uh, kind of correct this because I do think that uh, DEP and the local municipality should be talking. There should be an open dialogue and communication going on between them and because uh, as you mentioned earlier, weeks or months go by, 84 days, um, before being notified that there's something going on in your, in your um, district or jurisdiction. So um, I just believe that we need to open the, the dialogue and the communication between DEP and our local municipalities. I would so. be eager to work with you on that, Bill. Thank you, sir. That, that was all. Let me ask you the, the same question I asked the previous panel. Um, and briefly, because as you know, we're, we're over. Uh, how do you rebuild trust in a community that has already suffered? Well, I, I would think that if we were meeting regularly to talk uh, together with the representatives of that company so that we could have an exchange that allows us to understand the reason for the problems they're confronting um, the reason for the, uh, the concerns that are raised when there is sludge placed in the facility that smells throughout the northern end of our township, we would hope that though they contend that there is not a, a uh, residence problem, there is because it, it wafts throughout the northern end of the township. Um, knowing that we have PCBs in there, um, I would hope that they would let us know if they believe there isn't reason for concern, they would notify us of that and we can have a dialogue as to why we shouldn't be worried about it instead of having people calling regularly afraid that their kids are going to get cancer. 
So I think dialogue is the, is the first response there. We are not being unreasonable. We want to see those claimed, uh, these uh, uh, quarries reclaimed. We want to see it being productive, tax-paying land. We're in favor of that. Please don't, however, behind our backs, cover up problems that you're experiencing and believe that we're not going to be concerned, that we are going to have trust. It's just not going to happen. So I thought we were on our way to building that trust once again and being able to work with them, only to find that we get told there is a PCB problem now that they didn't mention to us when we were sitting at a table together 15 minutes before I got it. It's just unreasonable for them to presume that we can maintain a civil response to that kind of treatment. So I don't know that I've answered your question. No, it's but I think that reasonable response. the dialogue is, is a reasonable expectation when you have a problem like this in the community. I'm still hoping we can deal with this and we can figure out a way to be more appropriately informed by the DEP and by the, the uh, property owner. I'm also curious, one of you had referenced the tire pile. Yes. If you can provide information to me on that after the, uh, the hearing, I'm the prime sponsor of a bill that Governor Ridge signed that is, I think, reclaimed something like 20 or 30 million tires, and I'm curious as to why those were buried rather than used and, and recycled. And so, uh, uh, but that's, that's a subject for another day. Um, I want to thank all of you for, for coming, for attending, uh, for our representatives. Uh, Representative McNeil, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, understand Senator Buscola's staff is here as well as a Senator, Bus uh, Senator Buscola. Senator Scavello had indicated uh, this, this uh, information is going to be listed on, on his website as well as mine. Uh, we've asked uh, DEP for some uh, follow-up information. That information will also uh, be, uh, be found there. And uh, we've obviously got a lot of work to do, but this has been very helpful. Uh, thank you all. We stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for doing this.